Hello friends, this is Mike Williams. This presentation looks at the very controversial topic of whether the Beatles wrote all of their own music. The mainstream narrative tells us the Beatles, specifically the Lennon and McCartney team, were two of the most prolific and brilliant songwriters of the 20th century, with people frequently using the term genius to describe the songwriting duo. Although most people embrace the official story of the Beatles and their songwriting abilities, there are those that have questioned this premise throughout the Beatles' timeline. To try to understand whether the Fab Four did or did not write all of their own material, I pulled together a small team of researchers, comprised of musicians, songwriters, composers, and arrangers, each with decades of experience, to take a deeper dive into this part of the Beatles' conspiracy. Now before we get started, this presentation is geared toward those familiar with my work into the McCartney conspiracy. Having this background will be helpful as you watch this video, as well as approaching this with an open mind. It's important to set aside preconceived notions and beliefs. Embracing dogma will only cloud your critical thinking. As you watch the presentation, think in terms of how other aspects of our reality are engineered and controlled. For example, governments, politics, media, and the entertainment industry. And then ask yourself, why would the music industry be any different? Try to assess the information presented within the context of all the findings. One example by itself might not be meaningful, but a stream of evidence can be very compelling. Throughout the presentation, mainstream sources were used whenever possible. At the end of this video, I will share my perspectives on what I presented. As I have stated many times before, I am not trying to convince anyone of anything. I am simply presenting my analysis. I encourage everyone to do their own research and draw their own conclusions. And now let's take a moment and understand where this part of the Beatle conspiracy did not come from. Contrary to ideologues, many of which who have not read the memoirs of Billy Shears, Memoirs does not discuss the topic of whether the Beatles wrote all of their own music. Therefore, this presentation does not source information from Memoirs unless specifically noted for the purposes of complementing this discussion. And now let's move to the table of contents. In part one, I will discuss the premise that the questioning of the Beatles' songwriting prowess has been pondered and debated since the beginning of their popularity. In other words, this is not a new discussion. Then in part two, I will give a brief overview of the argument, both pro and con. In part three, we will analyze the 1962 through 1966 timeline to get a feel for where the Beatles spent their time. I focused on this time period because it represents a quantum leap forward in the songwriting abilities of Lennon and McCartney. In part four, we will analyze the findings of a mainstream source and look into some melodies and riffs the Beatles borrowed or pinched from other songs. In part five, we will discuss Dr. John Coleman and his book on the Committee of 300, where he claims the Beatles were a creation of Tavistock. We will also understand how the Aquarian conspiracy comes into play along with the role of Theodore Adorno and Willis Harmon as facilitators of social engineering on behalf of the Deep State. In Part 6, we will take a look into some session musicians and music industry insiders and their contributions and opinions. In Part 7, we will take a deep dive into the making of Rubber Soul, which I believe is the elephant in the room. In Part 8, we will take a look into the official narrative around the White Album and discuss potential anomalies there. And we will wrap up with part nine, where I will share my personal thoughts and commentary on the findings. Let's move to part one. It's important to start this presentation by recognizing the question of whether the Beatles wrote all of their own music has been debated since they exploded onto the pop music scene almost 60 years ago. In 1963, Paul McCartney was only 21 years old and John Lennon 23. But even though both Lennon and McCartney could not read or write music, or had any formal musical training, they turned out hit after hit, with each subsequent album growing in song complexity and maturity. We have to ask ourselves, is going from Love Me Do in 1963 to Tomorrow Never Knows in 1966 even possible? Can songwriting skills and abilities develop that quickly, 
from a band whose resume up to the recording of their first album, Please Please Me, consisted of playing cover music in bars and clubs. We are told the Beatles wrote and recorded approximately 200 original compositions from 1962 through 1969. This number of original songs is deemed suspect by an inquisitive segment of professional songwriters. Some also note how the lyrics of many of the songs appear beyond the life experience of 20-year-olds. Even the mainstream narrative tells us the complexity of the songs evolved at a very rapid pace. How did this happen? Did the inner circle of George Martin, who was known as the Fifth Beatle, along with Hired Guns, help to write these songs? These are some of the questions we will be investigating. Now let's touch on some of the arguments, both pro and con, as to whether the Beatles wrote their own music. The common arguments for the Beatles writing all their own music typically goes like this. The Beatles were incredibly talented. The Beatles were musical geniuses. The Beatles were exceptional songwriters. The Beatles were a supernatural force. And last but not least, the Beatles were not the monkeys. And now let's take a look at the arguments against the Beatles writing all of their own songs. The number of original songs written and recorded between 1962 and 1966 is highly unlikely when factoring in the hectic live performance and touring schedule, along with the multitude of interviews, press conferences, and photo ops the Beatles participated in, including two major films while also attending to their personal lives. Therefore, the evolution of the songwriting from 62 through 66 by untrained songwriters going from basic rock to complex compositions, appears suspect. Also, the music contained clear evidence of advanced music theory when none of the Beatles could read or write music, with the exception of Billy. Now let's take a listen to a clip from Davy Jones of the Monkees and what he had to say about the Beatles. The Beatles were the first manufactured group, not the Monkees. It was the Beatles. Brian Epstein dumped uh, Pete Best. I played with Pete a couple of months ago. Um, and they dumped Pete. They brought in Ringo. I don't know what, whether the dissension between John and Pete, whatever it was, there was something going on. Anyway, I didn't know anything about any of that. And they, they dressed them in the same suits, and they put the Cabezio shoes on, you know, with the boots on. They, 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 actually, there were Oliver boots that we used on the Oliver stage. They had the little Oliver haircut, like a little, you know, like a little beetle bowl cut. And they put, presented them all the same way. J -j 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 um, Paul was playing this way. John was playing this way. Ringo was doing his thing, throwing his hair around. Now let's take a moment and wrap up part one. With this slide, we can see a comparison between the songs on the Beatles' first album, Please Please Me, and their sixth album, Rub a Soul. The grayed-out songs represent cover tunes. The Beatles went from Love Me Do and Please Please Me to songs like Norwegian Wood, Nowhere Man, In My Life, and Drive My Car. The maturity and complexity of the music certainly takes quite a leap, after only two and a half years. Here's the same comparison between their second album with the Beatles and their seventh album, Revolver. The release of these two albums are separated by less than three years. The lads went from writing songs like Little Child and All My Loving to Eleanor Rigby, For No One, and Tomorrow Never Knows. Again, the transformation in the complexity and quality of the music is extremely impressive in such a short period of time. So the question becomes, from 1963 with the release of Please Please Me to 1966 and Revolver, did the Lennon and McCartney team naturally evolve to this level of songwriting? The early albums like Please Please Me, With the Beatles and Beatles for Sale were comprised of both original material and cover songs. Then the original compositions evolved significantly in both complexity and sophistication in a very short period of time. In fact, their third album, A Hard Day's Night, consisted of 13 original songs and no covers, a feat that was unheard of back in the day. Is this a natural progression, or is there more to the story? To try to answer this question, let's proceed to part two and dig a little deeper. Now we're going to take a look at how the Beatles spent their time between 1962 and 1966. Obviously, this analysis is not an exact science, but I believe it will give us a good estimate on how their time was allocated. During the 62 through 1966 time frame, we are told the Beatles wrote and recorded seven albums containing 97 songs, 77 of which were original compositions. And please note the seven albums and 77 original songs 
which regroups to the occult number of 777, which is referred to as the lightning flash of creation, which many occultists tie back to the Kabbalah and Alistair Crowley. There is a link in the description box if you wish to learn more about the meaning of the 777. The Beatles wrote, rehearsed, and recorded 97 songs while logging 584 days of live performances and touring over this time period. In 1962 and 1963 alone, the Beatles spent 473 days over those two years, or 65% of their time, playing live. They attended many interviews and press conferences, along with frequent photo opportunities and photo shoots. They starred in two movies, A Hard Day's Night and Help. They had promotional obligations and fan-based activities, such as Christmas records and television appearances. They spent time with family and friends, and they had to eat and sleep. As we can start to see, their schedule over this period was hectic. Some might even say grueling and exhausting. The girls still screamed, but the excitement was gone. Touring had become intolerable. And it became a terrible prison for them because um, all they could do was to go to the concert and then go back to their hotel room and be locked in. They had no life at all, they were just the four of them, and no one knows what kind of a life it was except those four themselves. Not even Brian nor I knew really all the problems they had to go through when they were on tour. It's a bit hard when you get up first thing in the morning and you travel all day. You get to a hotel and there's thousands of people outside. You're out in your bedroom. So how they came through, I just don't know. I know this is a detailed slide, but don't worry. I will be breaking it down as we move along this segment of the presentation. To get started, I wanted to understand where the Beatles spent their time. So I took a look at their first seven albums, starting with Please Please Me and ending with Revolver. The columns, denoted by the red balls, are numbered one through seven. Column one is the album. Column two represents the total number of songs on that record. Column three is the number of original songs. Column four shows the number of days between the start and finish dates for the recording of that particular album. Five is when the record was released. Six contains the dates and days for the filming of A Hard Day's Night and Help, and column seven counts up the number of days the lads spent playing live or touring. Live equates to shows based in the UK and tours are performances outside the United Kingdom. The recording start to finish dates includes recording, mixing, mastering, and finalizing the lacquer, which is used to press the actual records. It may also include some degree of rehearsal. Also, the number of days between the start and stop dates is not contiguous in all cases. For example, the making of With the Beatles was recorded in seven sessions contained within the 97 days. Times when the Beatles were not in the studio or actively participating might be when George Martin was mixing, editing, or mastering songs, or if the Beatles had other commitments scheduled, as they did when they received their NBEs during the Rubber Soul timeline. We can see the Beatles spent one day recording their first album, Please Please Me, and then 97 days to make With the Beatles, 125 days to make A Hard Day's Night, 76 days for Beatles for Sale, 124 days for help, 37 days for Rubber Soul, and 77 days on Revolver. It is interesting to note that during the recording of A Hard Day's Night and the Help albums, the Beatles were also filming the respective movies. This means there is overlap between the making of the album and the making of the films. For example, the 53 days of filming A Hard Day's Night is embedded within the 125 days of recording the Hard Day's Night album. The same goes for Help. The 51 days of filming the movie is sandwiched in between the recording of the Help album. Along with the overlap between the albums and the films, there was also overlap between live performance dates, meaning the Beatles were also doing gigs during the same time period they were recording their albums and filming their movies. If we look at column 7, we can see the Beatles played live 226 out of 365 days out of the year in 1962, or 62% of the year. In 1963, they played live or toured 68% of the year. In 1964, 47% of the year was spent performing 
and then the number dips to 15% and 16% respectively for the years of 1965 and 1966. In an upcoming slide, I will show the live performance overlap with regard to the recording of each album. The old saying, no rest for the weary, certainly comes to mind. Now let's move to the next slide. This chart shows the overlap between the Hard Day's Night album and the movie. We can see they were done in parallel. Please pause the video if you would like to study the slide. And now the same parallel process for help. The 51 days to make the movie overlaps with the 124 days of recording the album. This slide shows the live performance and touring overlap by album. Let's focus on A Hard Day's Night, Beatles for Sale, and Help. The yellow arrows pointing to the blue bars shows the total number of days start to finish to record each album. Arrow number one represents A Hard Day's Night. We can see the album spanned 125 days and sandwiched in between is 17 days of live performances and 53 days of filming. In other words, the 17 days of live performances and 53 days of filming are embedded within the 125 days to make the album. The same applies for the next two records. Arrow number two is Beatles for Sale. We can see the 76 days to record the album and 40 days of live performances overlapping with the recording time frame. Arrow number three is pointing to the making of the Help album. Here we see the Beatles did 13 days of live performances during the recording time frame, as well as 51 days of working on the film. Now it's important to point out that the Beatles were not necessarily on the movie set filming every day. The same goes for the recording studio. Days when they were not required to be on the set or in the studio, they would be attending to other activities. However, between the recording of the albums, the films, and the live performances, their schedule was packed, leaving what appears to be very little downtime for the lads to engage in the creative process of writing songs. Now let's take a closer look at how much time they might have had to write music. Now before we continue on with part three of this presentation, I wanted to give an overview of how songs are typically written, and then discuss the likelihood of a band writing music while recording, touring, or filming a movie. Writing music is a creative process. Sometimes the music comes first by playing chords on the guitar or the piano, and hitting on something that sounds good to the songwriter, and other times, the lyrics come first. If the music comes first, then the lyrics are written to fit the music, and vice versa. Then the songwriter starts to write the structure of the song. This would include the verse, bridge, chorus, and melody. After working through the structure, a draft or working version of the song is created. But even after a working version of the song is written, there are still puts and takes to further adjust things like the chords, the lyrics, and the melody. If the song falls flat, or the songwriter is not satisfied with the verse or the chorus, the song might be shelved forever or set aside to be revisited at a later date. If the song is deemed worthy, then the songwriter will present the song to their band members or collaborators. Once the song is presented to other band members or collaborators, there is usually additional changes and adjustments to the song based on feedback and rehearsal. The band then rehearses the final version of the song in preparation of heading to the recording studio. Once in the studio, the band will record the basic tracks. Getting the basic tracks down may result in several or sometimes dozens of takes to finalize. Then the band will add overdubs, which would include vocals, harmonies, arrangements, etc. The song is then mixed down and then mastered. After the mastering is done, the lacquer is cut, sleeve art and labels are created, and the records are sent off to be pressed. It is important to understand there is almost always starts and stops with song creation. Many times a songwriter will start writing a few songs in order to get to one which they consider worthy of recording. And now let's move to the next slide. As we go through the time analysis, some might be asking, could the Beatles have written songs while in the recording studio or while they were on tour, or on the sets of A Hard Day's Night and Help. Although it is possible to write songs during recording sessions, while on tour, or on a movie set, it is not the norm. Songwriting is a creative process which requires time, and hectic schedules are not conducive to that process. Songs are typically written and well rehearsed before entering the recording studio. 
Using the studio to write, rehearse, and then record can be a very costly proposition, especially with a big label like EMI. So time is money. A well-rehearsed band will reduce studio time and associated costs. Touring and playing live usually means traveling by plane and bus from city to city or country to country and living out of hotels, which is also not conducive to writing. Writing music while making a movie is also an unlikely scenario. There is memorizing lines, rehearsal, tight schedules, and traveling to locations to shoot the movie, such as the Beatles did with Help. I wanted to cover these aspects of the songwriting environment to at least offer my perspective as we dig a little deeper into the next few slides. With this slide, along with the next two, I normalized the data to adjust for when studio work, filming, and live performance dates overlapped to avoid double counting. For example, if the data shows a date where the Beatles had multiple activities, such as studio work and playing live, or studio work and filming one of the movies, then that date is counted as one day, regardless of how many events took place on that day. This was done to avoid double counting in order to get a rough estimate on how much time might have been available to write music within a given year. With this slide, I grouped Please Please Me and With the Beatles. Both of these albums were released in 1963. As we can see in Slice 1, 11% of the Beatles' time was spent engaged in the recording process for Please Please Me and With the Beatles. Slice number 2 shows the Beatles spent 68% of their time in 1963, or 247 days out of the year, playing gigs. This leaves 76 days, or approximately two and a half months, to compose music and attend to other activities, which also means these 76 days were not solely dedicated to writing music since they had to have spent time with family, friends, and attend to other obligations, such as interviews, television appearances, and photo ops. Between these two albums, the Beatles are said to have penned 16 original songs, 8 for Please Please Me and 8 for With the Beatles. Now let's move to the next slide and take a look at 1964. In 1964, the Beatles released A Hard Day's Night and Beatles for Sale. Between these two albums, Lennon and McCartney are said to have written 21 original songs. All 13 songs for A Hard Day's Night, which was unheard of back in the day, and eight original songs for Beatles for Sale. Slice number one shows us that between the studio and the filming of A Hard Day's Night, the Beatles spent 108 days or 29% of their time engaged in that endeavor. Slice number two shows they spent 36 days or 10% of their time working on their Beatles for Sale album. Slice number three has the lads playing live and touring 47% of the time or 173 days out of the year. Slice number four then leaves us with 48 days or 13% of the time to potentially write music while also attending to other activities. As with the previous slide, time compression, or the lack of available time, is becoming a significant variable in the equation. So we have to ask the question, when did John Lennon and Paul McCartney have time to write their songs? Now let's take a look at 1965. In 1965, the Beatles released Help and Rubber Soul. We are told the Lennon and McCartney team with contributions from George Harrison wrote 26 original compositions, 12 for Help and 14 for Rubber Soul. Slice number one shows the boys spent 86 days, or 24% of their time, engaged in the recording of the Help album and the filming of the movie. Slice number two shows 37 days, or 10% of their time, was involved with Rubber Soul. Slice number three has the Beatles touring 54 days out of the year, accounting for 15% of their time. And slice number four shows a significant increase in time outside of the studio, film sets, and performing. The time to potentially engage in writing music and attending to other activities has dramatically grown to 188 days, or 51% of their time in 1965. Now, even though the amount of time to potentially write music has increased, so has the level of complexity of the songs. And it's logical to assume that not all of that freed up time was dedicated to songwriting since there were other activities and engagements that were most likely being attended to. Both Help and especially Rubber Soul are considered to be pivotal moments in the evolution of the Beatles' songwriting abilities where the music has grown in maturity and complexity. 
a characteristic that carries over and evolves even further with the release of Revolver in 1966. And as we will see later in the presentation, when I analyze the making of Rubber Soul, the official narrative regarding timelines and songwriting becomes even more suspect. With this slide, I wanted to take a look at the time between each album the Beatles released and how much of that time was spent playing live. If we look at row one of the table, I calculated 158 days between the release of Please Please Me and the beginning of the recording of their next album with the Beatles, with 111 or 70% of those days accounting for live performances. We have the same trend between With the Beatles and A Hard Day's Night, where out of 99 days in between records, 75 of those days, or 76% of their time, was spent performing. The number then jumps to 97% between A Hard Day's Night and Beatles for Sale. The number then drops to approximately a quarter of their time between Beatles for Sale going into Help and then from Help into Rubber Soul. The performing then declines to 6% of their time after Rubber Soul going into Revolver. The reason this chart is important is because the time in between albums is typically the time a band is writing music. For example, when did Lennon and McCartney write the 13 original songs for A Hard Day's Night when 76% of the days leading into the recording of the album were spent performing? Even at 25 or 28%, this in my view would present challenges, especially with the Beatles touring abroad as they did in 1964 and 1965. How is it possible for the lads to crank out top-shelf songs with this type of schedule? And now, let's summarize the time analysis. The Beatles released seven albums and 77 original songs, 97 with covers, from 1962 through 1966. Their live performance and touring schedule from 62 through 64 was extensive. There was overlap between studio recording and the filming of their movies, A Hard Day's Night and Help. Some live performances and touring also overlap with studio time. The schedule from 62 through 64 was hectic and appears to have left very little time for songwriting and collaboration, with time finally freeing up in 65 and 66. In my opinion, the analysis shows significant time compression with regard to available time to compose, which begs the question, when did John Lennon and Paul McCartney have time to write music? Based on this analysis, I determined a deeper dive was required to determine whether the Beatles wrote all their own music, since the data raises more questions than it answers. Now let's listen to three clips where the mainstream narrative contains some interesting commentary, and then we will take a look at a Mercy Beat article from 1962 talking about the Beatles going to EMI to record. The audio and video were sourced from Anthology and the Complete Beatles documentaries. Let's take a listen. In this first clip from the Complete Beatles documentary from 1982, we are told that John Lennon and Paul McCartney wrote over 100 songs together since 1956. John and Paul had written at least 100 songs together since they met in 1956, but they hadn't recorded any, original or otherwise. Not until they went to Hamburg again in 1960 did they make their first record, and then only as a backup group for their friend Tony Sheridan. The result? An awkward rock and roll arrangement of My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean. And now let's take a listen to a clip from Alan Williams, the Beatles' first manager, and what he had to say about booking the Beatles in Germany. The first gigs outside the college was at the Jacaranda, which was a, a tiny uh, little coffee bar where they played in the cellar. I think they got about uh, five shilling each. The Jacaranda was owned by Alan Williams, a small-time entrepreneur operating on Liverpool's Bohemian Fringe. His latest enterprise was supplying rock and roll groups to a club in Hamburg. When no other act was available, Williams proposed the Beatles. The group that was playing there was one of the, the big groups in Liverpool, which was uh, Derry and the Seniors, featuring Howie Casey, the lead. And he sent me a letter over saying, look, Alan, we've got a good thing going over here for all the Liverpool groups. But if you send that bum group, the Beatles, over to Hamburg, you're going to louse it all up. For God's sake, don't send them. Now let's take a listen to commentary from George Martin. At the beginning of the audio, George Harrison explains how the band's demo tape made it to Martin. And we also hear from John Lennon commenting on George Martin's great musical background. 
something which I believe was instrumental in the rise of the Beatles' popularity and, most importantly, the songwriting. But the key with this clip is to listen to what George Martin has to say about his impressions of the Beatles' material when he was introduced to them back in 1962. So Brian then had this tape which he hawked around and I think it was somebody in the HMV shop on Oxford Street knew George Martin and told Brian to go and play the tape to George Martin and then he gave us the audition at um, Abbey Road. What I said to Brian was, if you want me to judge them on what you're playing me, I'm sorry, I have to turn you down. And he was so disappointed. I felt really sorry for him, actually, because he an earnest young man. And you must, you must have liked him, then? I, I did like him. And I, I said, but I tell you what, I gave him a lifeline. I said, if you want to bring them down from Liverpool, I'll give them an hour in the studio, OK? George had done little of the, uh, no rock and roll when we met him, and we'd never been in a studio, so we did a lot of learning together. He had a very great musical knowledge and background. I first met the Beatles in 1962. I wasn't terribly impressed with the first stuff they did. I couldn't make out the sound, you know, it was something I hadn't heard before. And they had this wonderful charisma. They, they made you feel good to be with them. Mm. And uh, I thought their music was rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> Even though they had uh, nothing really behind them, they were still fairly irreverent, even in those days, which I, which I loved. You know, I, I, I like a little bit of rebel in people, and I like their sense of humour. Uh, after all, that was my main stock in trade, too. And I guess they quite liked what I'd been doing with Peter Sellers and the Goons and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I looked at these four guys and thought, well, none of them shines as being above all the others. And I had to make up my mind, in my silly mind, who the lead singer was going to be. Suddenly I realized I would take them as they were, as a group. The hell with a lead singer. They would be singing together. So we were struggling with the sound a bit. And I said to the boys, after we'd done a few takes of rather nondescript songs, I said, come into the control room and have a listen and see what we've been doing. And uh, if there's anything you don't like, tell us. Well, I was looking for something original because I didn't want to do one of the oldies that they've been doing as part of their act. And Love Me Do was the best song that they, I could find from them at that time. I was very conscious that it wasn't the, the big hit I was looking for. I found these clips to be an interesting study in contrast. We are told Lennon and McCartney wrote over 100 songs together since 1956, which was six years prior to meeting George Martin. I would think they should have had quite a portfolio of original songs to present by 1962. Then Alan Williams, their first manager, tells us about the Beatles being referred to as a bum group when he was trying to get them to Germany. Then we hear from George Martin himself, telling us he was not impressed with their material, calling it rubbish, commenting they had nothing behind them, None of them shines above all the others, and Love Me Do was not what he was looking for. The official story then tells us the Beatles brought in a revamped version of Please Please Me, and that became their big hit. But if by George Martin's own words, telling us they had nothing behind them, and Love Me Do was their best song, after allegedly writing 100 songs since 1956, then did the Beatles really write Please Please Me, or even Love Me Do? Let's move to the next slide for some insight. Here's a 1962 article from the Mercy Beat. It is the August 23rd through September 4th edition. Let's read what it says about the Beatles replacing Pete Best with Ringo Starr. Ringo Starr, former drummer with Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, has joined the Beatles replacing Pete Best on drums. Ringo has admired the Beatles for years and is delighted with his new engagement. Naturally, he is tremendously excited about the future. The Beatles commented, Pete Bass left the group by mutual agreement, there were no arguments or difficulties, and this has been an entirely amicable decision. On Tuesday, September 4th, the Beatles will fly to London to make recordings at EMI Studios. They will be recording numbers that have been specifically written for the group, which they have received from their recording manager, George Martin. So there you have it from 1962 an article which many would consider a smoking gun. It clearly states 
the Beatles will be recording numbers specifically written for the group, which they received from their recording manager, George Martin. Now, before we begin part four of the presentation, let's finish up this segment with a clip from Ringo, where he refers to the songwriters as the quote-unquote writers versus John and Paul. Let's take a listen. Our whole attitude was changing. Um, we'd grown up a little. Uh, I think grass was really influential in a lot of our changes. Um, especially with, with the writers. Especially with, with the writers. You know, so because they were writing different stuff, uh, we were playing differently. We were all, you know, expanding in, in all areas of our life, you know, opening up to a lot of different uh, attitudes. In this section, or part four of the presentation, we will take a look at some songs where the Beatles borrowed or pinched from other songs and artists. It is not uncommon for bands to be influenced by other musicians or songs, and that influence can make its way into that band's own music. However, too much borrowing can lead to plagiarizing. Wikipedia describes music plagiarism as the use or close imitation of another author's music while representing it as one's own original work. Plagiarism in music now occurs in two contexts, with a musical idea, that is the melody or motif, or sampling, taking a portion of one sound recording and reusing it in a different song. Another website called Lawyer Drummer tells us that in the event of a trial, the person claiming infringement must prove two things. First, access, that the infringer had heard or could reasonably be presumed to have heard the original song prior to writing their song. And two, substantial similarity, that the average listener can tell that one song has been copied from the other. The more elements that the two works have in common, the more likely they are substantially similar. Now, I'm not saying the Beatles or whoever else may have been involved in writing their music plagiarized anyone else's material. That, of course, would be up to the person or publisher who believes they were plagiarized. The purpose of this segment is to illustrate how some of the Beatles' music may have gotten a little help from some friends. So let's step through some examples using a December 2015 Rolling Stone article which covered this topic. The article titled The Beatles' Five Boldest Ripoffs explains how Revolution borrowed from Pee Wee Creighton's Do Unto Others, Come Together from Chuck Berry's You Can't Catch Me, which Lennon was sued for in 1973 by Chuck Berry's publisher, I Feel Fine, borrowed from Bobby Parker's Watch Your Step, I Saw Her Standing There from Chuck Berry's I'm Talking About You, and Lady Madonna from Humphrey Littleton's Bad Petty Blues. Now let's compare the songs. The similarities are pretty obvious to me, but I will let you decide what you think. In some cases, I had to use a karaoke version of the song in order to avoid copyright issues. I will play the Beatles song first, and then the song Rolling Stone claims it borrowed from. So here's Revolution and Pee Wee Creighton's Do Unto Others. And now come together and Chuck Berry's You Can't Catch Me. Come on, flat top, he was moving up with me. Then come waving goodbye in a little old suit duck jitney. I put my foot in my tank and I'll be... Here's I Feel Fine and Bobby Parker's Watch Your Step. Now, I saw her standing there, and Chuck Berry's I'm Talking About You. Let me tell you about a girl I know. I met her walking down a uptown street. She's so fine, you know, I wish she was mine. I get shook. 
fuck up every time we meet. Lady Madonna and Humphrey Littleton's Bad Penny Blues. Now, two of the songs we compared were I Saw Her Standing There and Chuck Berry's I'm Talking About You. Here's an article from Showbiz Cheat Sheet that talks about John Lennon hearing Don't Let Me Down in Rod Stewart's Killing of Georgie. But what caught my eye with this article was the lead-in, where they talk about how Paul McCartney played the exact bass line from Berry's I'm Talking About You in the Beatles song I Saw Her Standing There and didn't deny it. The article goes on to say, On that track, You'll hear Paul McCartney playing the exact bass line from Barry's I'm Talking About You. Quote, I played exactly the same notes as he did, and it fit our number perfectly. When I tell people about it, I find few of them believe me. Now, the comment about fitting perfectly is interesting because to have the perfect fit, you would think most everything else in a song needs to fit as well. Now, let's move to one of the most notable plagiarizing cases involving a Beatle. George Harrison was sued and lost the case over the similarities between My Sweet Lord and the Chiffons He's So Fine. When John Lennon was asked about the lawsuit in the 1980 Playboy interview, Lennon responded, he walked right into it. He knew what he was doing. Then when the interviewer asked John if he was saying George consciously plagiarized the song, Lennon said, he must have known. He's smarter than that. Now let's take a listen and compare My Sweet Lord side by side with the Chiffons He's so fine. So did you hear any similarities? Now let's move to some other examples of possible song borrowing by the Beatles. Canzona Napolitana, or Neapolitan song, is Italian music with its roots in Naples, Italy, and has been very influential in Western Europe musical traditions and is expressed in familiar genres such as the love song and serenade. The music was very popular in the late 1800s, and many famous Neapolitan songs, such as O Sole Mio, became a permanent part of the musical consciousness. The music migrated outside of Italy when Italian immigrants brought the music abroad, and then popularized by performers such as Enrico Caruso in the early 1900s when he sang at the New York Metropolitan Opera. I'm going to play an Italian clip which I had a friend help to translate and give me a synopsis. I also added captions. And what is being expressed in the video is how Neapolitan song influenced the Beatles and their music. The video discusses Hey Jude and Yesterday as two examples. Hey Jude is compared to O Sola Mio and Yesterday with Santa Chiara. The narrative is portraying a proudness that the music of Naples has inspired the compositions of the Beatles. Now as you listen, think to yourself, how did four middle-class scousers from Liverpool learn about Neapolitan song? What is the likelihood that Lennon and McCartney, who were in their early 20s, were sitting down and listening to Italian music as they formulated their own songs? Keep that question in mind as you view the clip. Here's the video. Hey Jude, don't make it bad. Take us out. 
La musica napoletana è molto presente nelle canzoni di Beatles. Ad esempio, E il Giud o Sole Mio, adesso io ve la suono, sembra la stessa canzone. Stesse note, stesse battute, stessa cadenza. È un filo musicale che unisce Liverpool a Napoli. Nel 2006 il maestro Lilli Greco, leggendario scopritore di cantautori come De Gregori e Benditti, raccontò al TG2 di somiglianze precise tra le melodie dei Beatles e vecchie arie napoletane. Ho ascoltato questa canzone eh, che mi dissero composta intorno al 1890-95 e che fa così. Picere, picere che viene a dire, stanotte tu sarai con me, con me, con me. E a Londra incontrai eh, casualmente eh, Brian Epstein, che era il, il manager, il rappresentante massimo dei Beatles, eh, il quale mi disse che Lennon eh, ascoltava musica 24 ore su 24 e da Palestrina ai canti armeni lui sapeva tutto. Evidentemente anche Paul McCartney che stava lì con lui, ascoltavano insieme. Lili Greco, il maestro Lili Greco, aveva ragione, la sua teoria è esatta. Anche i Beatles non è che plagiassero, si ispiravano alla cultura napoletana, alla melodia. Ad esempio uno dice, yesterday, yesterday è simile a Monasterio Santa Chiara. Lui si dice, perché? Adesso va a sostituire, ve lo dico. Yesterday. Attenzione a questa scala, Monasterio Santa Chiara. Un... Queste due scale sono identiche e uniscono Liverpool a Napoli, come ho detto prima. Il gruppo Shampoo negli anni 70 ripropose i successi dei Beatles in lingua napoletana. La migliore dimostrazione delle assonanze tra il repertorio Beatles e il repertorio napoletano. Now let's play a clip of Billy, aka Paul McCartney, telling the story behind how the Beatles song Yesterday came about in a Colbert interview from September 2019. Do you ever write songs in your dreams? Yeah. All right. Yesterday. What? Yesterday yeah. was written in a dream? Uh -huh. I didn't know that. Please, tell, tell me. Um, I woke up one morning and there was this tune in my head. And I, I, I was, uh, I happened to have a piano by my bed. It was a little uh, apartment. And uh, so, what's this? What is this? So I thought, it's just some old tune my dad must have played. Or I've just heard it yesterday, uh, you know. Um, and so I went round to all my friends, to John first. What's this? What's, what's this tune? Da -da 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 -da. I don't know. So I went to uh, George Martin, the producer. George, what's this? You know a lot of songs. What's this? Da -da -da. He said, I don't know. So after about a couple of weeks, I decided it was mine. <laughs> <laughs> and no one came out of the woodwork. No, not yet. Ho ascoltato questa canzone eh, che mi dissero composta intorno al 1890-95 e che fa così.
picere, picere che viene a dicere, stanotte tu sarai con me, con me, con me. I found Billy's comments to be very interesting. Many Beatle fans and researchers know about the story where yesterday came to Paul in a dream. But then Billy adds to the story by telling us Paul went around checking to see if anyone had ever heard the melody before. The comment by Colbert at the end of the dialogue that no one stepped out of the woodwork, and then Billy responding, not yet, was also an interesting exchange. Now I know there are those who will say Billy is just making up stories, but I have found that what Billy says and releases publicly is very calculated, and I will show another example of this in a moment. I believe it is possible that Billy was dropping a clue regarding the true nature of where the song Yesterday originated from. And if this is what Billy is doing, then Paul McCartney did not write Yesterday. The song is then a reworking of perhaps an old Neapolitan song, which would have been written long before the Beatles ever existed. Then we need to ask, who in the inner circle would know of such songs? Would it have been a 23-year-old lad from Liverpool, or someone with a well-rounded musical background, perhaps someone like George Martin. Now let's move to the next slide and talk about the song In My Life. Back in July of 2018, this article appeared in The Telegraph. Sir Paul McCartney misremembers writing In My Life. It was really John Lennon, says Harvard Analysis. The article goes on to say that Paul McCartney has long claimed that he actually penned the melody, telling a music writer and broadcaster in the 1970s those were the words John wrote, and I wrote the tune to it. That was a great one. Paul claimed to have set Lennon's lyrics to music after being inspired by songs by Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. Yet up to his death, Lennon said only the middle eight and harmonies were Sir Paul's work. Then the article tells us that Harvard and Dalhousie University used computer models to prove it was Lennon's song. So the establishment machine jumps into damage control, by trying to convince the audience that a computer analysis resolved the discrepancy. In my opinion, it would be astonishing for someone to not remember their level of participation in a song that is as famous as In My Life. In My Life is ranked 23rd on Rolling Stone's 500 Greatest Songs of All Time, as well as 5th on their list of the Beatles' 100 Greatest Songs. The song placed 2nd on CBC's 50 Tracks. Mojo Magazine named it the best song of all time in 2000. Is Billy telling us someone else wrote the music? Perhaps he's even telling us it was him behind the scenes as a creative force during the Biopol era. And now let's talk about the lyrics to the song In My Life. The highlighted area on the image to the right contains what we are told are the original lyrics to In My Life. The first verse, which is not highlighted, shows the revised lyrics. Why the revised lyrics are at the top of the piece of paper seems odd to me, but I will go with what we have. The narrative tells us John Lennon thought the original version was too personal, and so he rewrote the lyrics. I'm going to read the original lyrics first, and then I'll read the revised version, which ended up in the song. As we read them, ask yourself, does the wording and style seem like the same person writing these lyrics? Or does it appear as if there are two different writers involved in the process? Here are the original lyrics. Penny Lane is one I'm missing. Up Church Road to the Clock Tower. In the circle of the Abbey, I have seen some happy hours. Past the tram sheds with no trams. On the five bus into town. Past the Dutch and St. Columbus. To the docker's umbrella that they pull down. And now the version of the lyrics on Rubber Soul. There are places I'll remember, all my life, though some have changed. Some forever, not for better. Some have gone, and some remain. All these places had their moments, with lovers and friends I still can recall. Some are dead, and some are living. In my life, I've loved them all. But of all these friends and lovers, there is no one compares with you, and these memories lose their meaning when I think of love as something new. Though I know I'll never lose affection for people and things that went before, I know I'll often stop and think about them. In my life, I love you more. The original lyrics come across choppy and disjointed. It's written in prose with no metrical structure 
while the final version of the lyrics are polished with a cadence that flows and rhymes. To me, the style of writing appears completely different, and thus it reads like two different authors. What do you think? Now let's see if the final version of the lyrics were inspired by an old poem by Charles Lamb. Charles Lamb was an English essayist, poet, and antiquarian. He also wrote a poem called The Old Familiar Faces. In the next slide, we will read a part of the poem and see if you pick up on any similarities between The Old Familiar Faces and In My Life. Here is a selection from Lamb's The Old Familiar Faces. I have had playmates, I have had companions, in my days of childhood, in my joyful school days. All, all are gone, the old familiar faces. How some they have died, and some they have left me, and some are taken from me. All are departed, all, all are gone, the old familiar faces. So what do you think? Does the overall theme appear similar to in my life? As I did the research, I found the connections back to Western classical traditions to be a common thread. And again, we have to ask, who would have weaved these influences into the music? Four Liverpool lads or people schooled in such traditions? This is a non-political occasion, so I'll stay non-political. Unless I'm tempted. <laughs> I said that yesterday and I was. <laughs> but um, there were attempt recently by a certain leader of a certain party, and wild horses wouldn't drag his name from me, <laughs> to involve our friends the Beatles in politics. And all I could say with great sadness, as a Merseyside member of Parliament, which I am, was that whatever other arguments there may be, I must ask, is nothing sacred when this sort of thing can happen? <laughs> So to keep out of politics, I just repeat to you what the Times musical correspondent said, referring to this music as distinctly indigenous in character, the most imaginative and inventive examples. And I'm sure the Times music correspondent spoke for all of us when he said of our friends, the Beatles, that harmonically, it is one of their most intriguing with its chains of pandiatonic clusters. <laughs> William Mann went so far as to point out in the London Times the chains of pandiatonic clusters in This Boy and the Aeolian cadence of Not a Second Time, which he compared to Gustav Mahler's Song of the Earth. He also called John and Paul the outstanding English composers of 1963. Pandiatonic clusters and Aeolian cadences. Some pretty highbrow stuff for a group of Liverpool lads who couldn't read or write music. Let's start with who William Mann was, what he wrote, and why. He was educated at Winchester College and Cambridge University, studying music with several prominent composers before taking up a career as a critic. As a critic, he spent most of his career on the staff of the Times in London. He wrote an article back in December of 1963 titled What Songs the Beatles Sang, where he talked about pandiatonic clusters and aeolian cadences in the songs of the Beatles. He rained praise on the lads for their thinking simultaneously of harmony and melody, building major tonic sevenths and ninths into their songs, using flat submediate key switches, and so on. The problem is, the Beatles had no idea what he was talking about. In fact, John Lennon said the following from his 1980 Playboy interview about Aeolian cadences. To this day, I don't have any idea what they are. They sound like exotic birds. With John also adding, None of us are technical musicians. None of us could read music. None of us can write it. And the use of the term composers is interesting as well, since people who compose are usually formally trained in music theory, and would argue there is a big difference between a composer and a songwriter. It's not necessary for a songwriter to receive any formal training in music composition and theory. There are plenty of examples of successful songwriters who have been completely self-taught or have little knowledge of music theory. On the other hand, we have commonly seen composers receiving extensive training in music composition and theory at the very start of their careers. Many composers even continue this lifelong musical journey, acquiring even more knowledge and expanding their skills for countless years. For example, Mozart was a composer, not a songwriter. Composers write many different styles of music such as classical, opera, and ballet whereas the songwriter is typically focused on music and lyrics. 
So William Mann referring to Lennon and McCartney as composers was done to elevate their status among the music critics and the upper crust of society who otherwise would consider the Beatles' music and rock and roll in general as primitive. Thus, the William Mann article was part of a massive propaganda program to paint Lennon and McCartney as composers and young musical geniuses so the band would be taken seriously and thus prepare the world, especially the United States, for the beginning of the British invasion. By setting this stage, the road was being paved for the Beatles to become a force in the shaping of society and the culture. Even George Harrison was surprised at how the notoriety came easier than he thought it would. John, so far, all British pop stars have not made a tremendous impact on the States. How do you think it's going to fare? Well, I can't really say, can I? I mean, is it up to me? No. I mean, I just hope we go all right. You know. But at that time, I didn't realize that Capitol Records had been told, you know, you can, okay, they wanted to have the Beatles, you see. So then Brian Epstein said, okay, well, you can have them then on condition you spend $70,000, which sounded enormous, but... They did, so that was part of the deal. They had to promote us, but I think there was more to it than that. They had a catchy single that took off. Plus Ed Sullivan had seen us in England and all the time and life and Newsweek had all put covers of the Beatles on their magazines prior to us arriving, so it was a surprise though because we thought we'd have to work a little bit for this notoriety. For those who are interested in digging into the intricacies of the structure of the Beatles' music, I highly recommend looking into Alan Pollock's analysis of the Beatle portfolio. In an effort that spanned 11 years, Mr. Pollock, who is a highly credentialed musicologist, analyzed every Beatles song. What I found as I read through many of the songs is the music structure was beyond the grade of musicians who lacked proper training in music theory and composition. Although this would apply across the entire Beatle timeline, it is especially noteworthy between the 1962 through 1966 period. We have to ask, who was really putting all this together? To answer that question, I think we can start with George Martin as the main protagonist. After 1966, I believe the role Martin played was then augmented and shared by Billy as they worked together. But throughout the Beatles' recording history, there is no doubt in my mind George Martin looms very large, much larger than we have been led to believe. Somehow the album seemed to grow by itself once I got into the um, compilation stage when I started putting the songs together and making them flow into each other. Now, George Martin was more essential to the Beatles' recording process than ever before. As the music became more complex, Martin, as composer, arranger and producer, continued to lead them into new musical territory. Here's a clip from Anthology where George Martin, Billy, George, and Ringo are discussing All You Need Is Love and whether it was written specifically for the Our World broadcast. As a backdrop, All You Need Is Love was the song the Beatles sang during the event on June 25, 1967, which was the first live worldwide satellite program reaching an international audience in excess of 350 million people. The clip is both telling and humorous at the same time since there's no unified recall on when exactly the song was written or if it was written specifically for the show. Something I found very strange, considering the magnitude of the song's importance in the broadcast. Let's take a listen. Sorry, you know, but, but there's plenty of people in England that haven't seen us unless they get, we do a world telly show and everybody watches at once through a satellite. That's the only way everybody would see us. It was supposedly the very first satellite hookup around the world. I don't know how many millions of people, but it was supposed to be some phenomenal amount of people. And it was a, probably the very earliest technology that enabled that kind of satellite link. John wrote All You Need Is Love specially for the television show. Um, it was a commission that was Brian suddenly whirled in and said, we are to represent Britain in this round the world hookup, and you've got to, you've got to write a song. Because the mood of the time, it seemed to be great idea to do that song because while everybody else was showing them people knitting in Canada and Irish clog dancers in Venezuela, we thought, well, we'll just sing All You Need Is Love because it's a kind of subtle bit of PR for um, God, basically. And I don't know if the song was written before that, 
because we were making an album at the time, so there was kind of lots of songs in circulation. Paul may know more about that. Over to you, Paul. Um, I'm not sure. It was John's song mainly. Um, I don't think it was written specially for it, but it was one of the songs we had, and, and I don't know, actually, George Martin might have a bit better idea than that. It was certainly tailored to it once we had it. But I've got a feeling it was just one of John's songs that was coming there. And we went down to Olympic Studios in Barnes and uh, recorded it. And, I, it um, and then it became the song they said, ah, this is the one we should use. I don't actually think it was written for it. Yeah, they wrote it specifically for that. And we all dressed up again. See, we were getting into it. We loved dressing up. <laughs> It seems odd there is a lack of consensus about whether All You Need Is Love was written for the Our World program, which was a major television event, the first of its kind. Even Wikipedia notes the strange dialogue stating, In their interviews for the Beatles anthology in the 1990s, McCartney and Harrison say they were unsure whether All You Need Is Love was written for Our World, while Ringo Starr and George Martin, the Beatles producer, assert that it was. McCartney said, it was certainly tailored to the broadcast once we had it, but I've got a feeling it was just one of John's songs that was coming anyway. Another mainstream source, The Beatles Bible, states emphatically that All You Need Is Love was written by John Lennon especially for Our World. But then we have Billy saying in the interview that the song was written mainly by John, which leads the listener to believe that someone else was involved, at least to some degree, with the writing of the song. But then Billy doesn't say it was him. Many will assume it was him, but that's just an assumption. Why wouldn't he have said, the song was primarily John's and I contributed to this part of it, or something to that effect? Earlier in his presentation, I ran a clip where Ringo talked about the quote-unquote writers instead of saying John and Paul. Then in this clip, he refers to the writers of All You Need Is Love as they. Who were they? Why didn't he say John? or John and Paul. I think it's because there was a lot more going on behind the scenes than meets the eye. To illustrate, let's take a look at what Wikipedia says about the song's composition and musical structure. All You Need Is Love contains an asymmetric time signature and complex changes. Musicologist Russell Rising writes that, although the song represents the peak of the Beatles' overtly psychedelic phase, the change in meter during the verses is the sole example of the experimental aspect that typifies the band's work in that genre. The main verse pattern contains a total of 29 beats, split into two 7-4 measures, a single bar of 8-4, followed by a one-bar return of 7-4 before repeating the pattern. The chorus, however, maintains a steady 4-4 beat, with the exception of the last bar of 6-4 on the lyric, Love is All You Need. The prominent cello line draws attention to this departure from pop single normality, although it was not the first time the Beatles had experimented with varied meter within a single song. Love You Too and She Said She Said were earlier examples. Wikipedia goes on to say, The song is in the key of G, and the verse opens with a G chord and D melody note, the chords shifting in a 1-5 minor 6 chord progression, while the bass simultaneously moves from the tonic note to the root note of the relative minor via an F sharp supporting a first inversion D chord. And with that, I will again quote John Lennon from his 1980 Playboy interview. None of us are technical musicians. None of us could read music. None of us can write it. Now let's move to part five of the presentation. Back in the early 1990s, Dr. John Coleman published the book Conspirators Hierarchy, the story of the Committee of 300. It was a groundbreaking book in that it exposed the Committee of 300 and named names, and we will get more into the Committee of 300 in a moment. In the book, Dr. Coleman states he was a British intelligence officer with access to highly classified documents. He tells us he was thoroughly familiar with the Royal Institute of International Affairs, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderberg Group, the Trilateral Commission, Zionism slash Bolshevism, Freemasonry, Rosicrucianism, and the many secret society spin-offs. In other words, Dr. Coleman was well-versed in the deep state and shadow government apparatus. In Conspirators Hierarchy, he also claims the Beatles were a creation of Tavistock and Theodore Adorno wrote the Beatles' music 
and lyrics. One of the arguments used to question or discredit Dr. Coleman, especially as it pertains to his allegations regarding the Beatles, is that although his book was prophetic, it lacks citations. Citations are difficult at best when the author is disclosing content based on highly classified or top-secret information not found in the public domain. In other words, the source material is simply not available. So unless Coleman was stealing documents and then publishing them, something that would have been extremely dangerous, more dangerous than writing or talking about it, citations would be hard to come by with this type of material. It should be noted the book's appendix does include a bibliography along with summaries and notes. But even without citations, it still remains that 30 years ago, Coleman accurately depicted the New World Order strategy via the Committee of 300. Conspirators' hierarchy spends the majority of its time digging into and exposing the deep state by providing information and insight that is a wealth of knowledge for anyone trying to understand the inner workings of the control system. In the book, Coleman also outlined 21 worldwide objectives, most of which are well underway and still relevant as centralized control becomes more and more evident with each passing day. It's also important to note that Coleman's book is not about the Beatles, but a book which discusses a deeper conspiracy that the Beatles were a part of, but when he got to those parts of the book, he certainly dropped a bombshell. As we continue with the presentation, we will be looking into the Tavistock and Adorno claims. And I also recommend reading the book and coming to your own conclusions. From page 265 in the 1992 edition of the book, Dr. Coleman published this flowchart showing the Committee of 300 at the top and then cascading down to the Royal Institute of International Affairs, Tavistock, and the Club of Rome, with many other international entities branching out or reporting into these groups. Please note Tavistock's prominence within the hierarchy. Coleman tells us the Committee of 300 is an all-powerful group who refer to themselves as the Olympians. They have no national boundaries, they are above the laws of all countries, and they control every aspect of politics, religion, commerce, industry, banking, insurance, mining, the drug trade, the petroleum trade, etc. And they are answerable to no one but its members. In the third edition of The Conspirators' Hierarchy, Dr. Coleman presented another flow chart showing how U.S. policymaking is controlled and channeled. At the top where issues are created and decided, we can see that along with the Committee of 300 itself, we have the royal families, top Illuminati members, a top tier of Freemasonry, and Tavistock. Now let's take a look at an interesting passage from the second edition of the Memoirs of Billy Shears. As I mentioned when I began this presentation, Memoirs does not talk about whether the Beatles wrote all their own music. But on page 351, and please note the page number sums to the number 9, there is an interesting passage where it appears possible that Memoirs is pointing the reader to Dr. Coleman's book. And now I'll read the passage starting on page 350. While the Beatles were performing in strip clubs over in Hamburg, Beatles folklore has it that their manager, Brian Epstein, convinced George Martin to consider recording them. Actually, George Martin's superior ordered it. Critical of Pete's image and skill, George had him replaced. Even though Brian Epstein, following George Martin's order, had already hired a replacement, Ringo, who already played a few times with them before. George Martin hired a new drummer to help with their recording sessions. Ringo showed up unaware of the redundancy. He got to help on the recording with tambourines, etc. George Martin was ordered to make the Beatles huge, even though he felt the band lacked talent. He then ordered Brian to clean up their image, to make them look presentable and innocent. With Martin's help, they would turn their little songs into big hits. He changed parts, added piano, networked with the media, and all else to make them marketable. He was eventually known as the fifth Beatle for doing so much, but was never a band member. When the Rolling Stones also got a recording contract, they opted to pass themselves off as the Beatles' nasty rivals. It played perfectly into the hands of the secret committee of 300. As the snitch said, with the Beatles in their right hand and the Stones in their left, they would transform the whole world. Now before I continue reading on, Notice Memoirs is referring to the Committee of 300 and the Snitch. Who is the Snitch? Are they referring to John Coleman? Let's continue. The Beatles would be promoted as the good boys of rock, while our friends, the Stones, would be promoted as hellish demons. The idea that came from a few rungs higher up the influence ladder than George Martin 
was that each band would split the world at its own level to achieve the societal fragmentation and disintegration that is necessary to have an irreversible cultural revolution back to the cult of Dionysus, a god of wine and madness. Everyone can ignore all that. The relevance here is that top-level social scientists, including Willis Harmon, who have ties to those over the conglomerates who control the media, gave us an opportunity to change the world. They made a special priority of these two bands sufficient to represent us to the world in a most powerful media light. The Beatles and Stones were distinct on our level of operation, but were used in concert by the social engineers for their global purposes. We did not receive their full detailed plan, but we did have heavy doors opened for us. As long as each band worked within their guidelines, and in quotations, Billy tells us that changed abruptly when he came along, everything played out perfectly. And that concludes page 351. So we have the Committee of 300, the Snitch, talk of social scientists, Willis Harmon, who Coleman also discusses in his book, the Beatles and Stones being used by social engineers, and the bands working within their guidelines, meaning playing their respective roles in the societal and cultural change. All of this aligns with Coleman's book, with the exception of memoirs not mentioning Theodore Adorno, and never specifically stating it was anyone other than the Beatles writing their songs. Although memoirs certainly solidifies George Martin's role as being extremely important in the Beatles story, something that aligns with what we have covered so far. Now, the omission of Adorno could possibly be an effort to distance memoirs from the songwriting conspiracy, but as we will see in the upcoming slides, Theodore Adorno and Willis Harmon operated within the very same circles. So this passage from memoirs is neither a confirmation or a denial, but it certainly is intriguing. Now let's take a look at some key players. This information comes from mainstream sources. Tavistock is engaged with the valuation and action research, organizational development and change consultancy, and executive coaching and professional development, all in service of supporting sustainable change and ongoing learning. Stanford Research Institute, or SRI's focus, includes biomedical sciences, chemistry and materials, computing, earth and space systems, economic development, education and learning, energy and environmental technology, security and national defense, as well as sensing and devices. Theodore Adorno was a German philosopher, sociologist, psychologist, and composer known for his critical theory of society. He was a leading member of the Frankfurt School. He is widely regarded as one of the 20th century's most foremost thinkers on aesthetics and philosophy, as well as one of its preeminent essayists. Willis Harmon, was an American engineer, futurist, and author associated with the human potential movement. He was convinced that the late industrial civilization faced a period of major cultural crisis which called for a profound transformation of human consciousness. For those not familiar with the human potential movement, or HPM, it arose out of the counterculture of the 1960s. It is the concept of cultivating extraordinary potential that advocates believe is largely untapped in all people and through the development of human potential, humans can experience an exceptional quality of life filled with happiness, creativity, and fulfillment. Those who unleash this potential often find themselves directing their actions within society towards assisting others with a net effect of bringing about positive social change at large. The human potential movement is directly linked to Tavistock's Aquarian Conspiracy, which we will discuss in a moment. This is a screen capture from Tavistock's website. The public face of Tavistock is like any other corporate entity where its website contains the standard information and overviews of who they are and what they do. I would like to point out their tagline where it says, We work with hidden, sometimes unconscious factors. Knowing Tavistock's role in the hidden world, I found the line very appropriate because that is exactly what they do. So this is a clue in plain sight something we see all the time within the control systems apparatus. Also, when we analyze Tavistock's overview, we can pick up on key words such as evaluation, development, coaching, action, learning, change, and sustainable. These are all words associated with transformation and social engineering. In the case of Tavistock, it is the transformation and re-engineering of the society and culture by altering human behavior and thinking via sophisticated mind control techniques, something they have been at for a long time and unfortunately 
something they are very good at. If we take the keywords, we can construct a process. For example, we evaluate a situation, then develop objectives or goals and build a plan. We then coach and delegate to people who are in positions of influence to implement that plan. For example, a Theodore Adorno or a Willis Harmon. These facilitators then put the plan into action. Then the intended recipients of the action, that would be the population, learn and adopt the new system and this adoption creates the intended change. The change is then maintained by ongoing reinforcement through propaganda or sometimes even force to make the change sustainable. Also, the balls at the top of the Tavistock page is a combination of a Venn diagram and relationship circles representing the interconnectivity of Tavistock's work. Now let's take a look at the hidden face of Tavistock. According to Dr. Coleman's work, we have the Committee of 300 at the very top, and then cascading down to the Royal Institute of International Affairs, and then Tavistock. Tucked within Tavistock's span of control is the Stanford Research Institute, MIT, the RAND Corporation, NATO, which includes the U.S. military, the drug business, the Hudson Institute, and the Wharton School of Economics. Tavistock is the world center for mass mind manipulation and social engineering activities. It is a sophisticated organization used to shape the destiny of the world by changing the paradigm of modern society. Tavistock has control mechanisms in academia, multimedia, intelligence, and medicine, especially pharmaceuticals. In fact, the use of drugs is a common denominator identifying Tavistock's strategy. Its range of disciplines include anthropology, economics, organizational behavior, political science, psychoanalysis, psychology, and sociology. Tavistock has developed such power in the U.S. that no one achieves prominence in any field unless they have been trained in behavioral science at Tavistock or one of its subsidiaries. Tavistock also controls the Esalen Institute, which is an American retreat center in Big Sur, California. From their website, Esalen's vision statement says, they are a major catalyst in the transformation of humankind, working with individuals and institutions to integrate heart, mind, body, spirit, and community in a nurturing relationship with the environment. And their mission statement goes on to tell us, they are a leading center for exploring and realizing human potential through experience, education, and research. They work toward the realization of a more just, creative, and sustainable world, seeking answers to questions unlikely to be explored by traditional universities and religions. They sponsor pioneering initiatives and offer personal, spiritual, and social transformation programs for residents, interns, and workshop participants. As we can see, the human potential movement of Willis Harmon is alive and well, and Esalen is a major player in solidifying the New Age movement, which leads us into the Aquarian Conspiracy. In 1980, Marilyn Ferguson wrote a book called The Aquarian Conspiracy, which William Grimes of the New York Times called The Bible of the New Age Movement. The book's publisher, Penguin Random House, extols the book as the human potential masterwork that defined the New Age and remains a thorough, detailed classic of contemporary thought, an impeccable document that traces one of the most powerful cultural movements of our age. Upon its initial publication in 1980, the mainstream media told us it was an exciting vision of the future, a handbook of the new age, and a new charter of human possibility, and that the Aquarian conspiracy 
was the birth of the New Age movement. Wikipedia tells us, Ferguson was a founding member of the Association of Humanistic Psychology. She published and edited the well-regarded science newsletter Brain Mind Bulletin from 1975 to 1996. She eventually earned numerous honorary degrees, served on the board of directors of the Institute of Noetic Sciences, or IONS, and as a side note, she would have certainly known Willis Harmon, who was the IONS president for two decades. She befriended such diverse figures of influence as inventor and theorist Buckminster Fuller, spiritual author Ram Dass, Nobel Prize winning chemist Ilya Prigogine, and billionaire Ted Turner. Ferguson's work also influenced Deepak Chopra, as well as Vice President Al Gore, who participated in her informal network while a senator and later met with her in the White House. In 1985, she was featured as a keynote speaker at the United Nations-sponsored Spirit of Peace Conference, where she appeared along with Mother Teresa and the Dalai Lama of Tibet. When she passed in 2008, the New York Times wrote, In the dawning new age, people would exercise their talents to the fullest. War and social hierarchies would disappear, and the human race, impelled forward by thrilling new scientific discoveries, would embrace the happiness that belonged to it by birthright. The future was not just bright, it was radiant. With Ferguson once telling an interviewer, we are going to see a burst of creativity that will make the Renaissance pale in comparison. By leveraging its controlled media, Tavistock made Marilyn Ferguson a celebrity guru, thus catapulting their human potential movement up and out of the counterculture of the 1960s and into the mainstream discourse under the brand we now know as the New Age movement. The Aquarian Conspiracy emerged from the late 1960s as a continuation of the human potential movement and was rebranded as the New Age movement. It was an engineered shift to move away from what Tavistock social scientists considered to be the rigid and oppressive system that was in place and which they believed stifled human potential. They would replace the system with one that they believed would free humanity from the shackles of the old culture and societal norms. The social engineers considered capitalism and institutionalized religion, specifically Christianity, as major obstacles that needed to be overcome. This transformation coincided with the astrological transition of the ages, going from what they considered to be the dark, violent age of Pisces to the millennium of love and light, or the age of Aquarius. For many studying the astrological sciences, humanity formally entered into the Aquarian age on December 21, 2012, the New Age would shift the mindset of the masses toward practicing metaphysics, awakening spiritually, and exploring ways to expand consciousness, which included the use of drugs. As we will see in the next slide, many planned events were rolled out by the controllers starting in the 1960s to radically transform the societal and cultural landscape. For example, Woodstock was known as the Aquarian Exposition. As I've mentioned previously in this presentation, the Esalen Institute played and still plays a major role in the breaking down of traditional religious beliefs. Within occult circles, some occultists equate the Age of Aquarius with the Age of Lucifer, where the water bearer represents the light bearer. Lucifer is also the phoenix rising from the ashes in order to bring enlightenment to the world. And as I've mentioned in previous presentations and shows, the spiritual beliefs and philosophy of many within the pyramid of power is Luciferianism. Now, before we continue on, I want to make it clear I am not advocating or endorsing any particular belief system or ideology. I am simply explaining the philosophy of the controllers based on my research. With this slide, I wanted to illustrate some of the major players and events that were put into play in order to systematically change the world. The culture which existed prior to the 1960s was one where traditional values and religious beliefs prevailed. The Committee of 300, Tavistock, and the social engineers considered this construct to be overtly rigid, even mechanical, thus stifling the potential of humanity. Players such as Elvis, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, and the entire British invasion were instrumental in reshaping the thinking of the younger generation. This was done to break the ties to their parents' way of life. Then the transformation proceeded with the introduction of the psychedelic era, which encompassed the Summer of Love, the Monterey Pop Festival, Woodstock, the hippie movement, free love, and of course the drug culture. The 60s then segued into the 1970s, 
where hedonism ramped up with the introduction of disco nightclubs such as Studio 54, which promoted the mindset, if it feels good, do it. We then experienced a further reshaping of pop music and the culture, where bands such as Kiss pushed the envelope by promoting Satanism as the adversary and alternative to traditional thought and religious beliefs. Then we saw the advent of androgyny with performers like David Bowie and the glam bands of the 1980s. The music industry brought us punk, grunge, techno, rap, hip-hop, and the ever-increasing sexual content in music to further dismantle what the controllers considered to be the old and uninspired ways of living and believing. When we step back and examine the timeline, the culture change from the 1950s through today is nothing short of startling, and it is all by design. The reason I took everyone through this part of the presentation is to show how our entire reality is engineered. Tavistock is a major player in the manipulation of the thoughts, beliefs, and values of the masses. The 1960s was a turnkey moment which kicked off the new paradigm we all reside in, and the Beatles were a major catalyst in that plan. And the change that was put in place is well underway and deeply embedded in our culture, our society, and the minds of just about everyone in Western culture, at least to some degree. Now let's listen to three clips having to do with the Beatles, which I believe illustrate the concepts of the Age of Aquarius and the New Age. The first clip is an interview with Derek Taylor, who was the Beatles' press officer. In the video, Taylor talks about being connected to the Beatles in order to be in the light, which is code for Lucifer, as Lucifer is the light bearer. Many times in the New Age movement, we hear phrases like light worker, and people using salutations such as love and light. The second clip has to do with John Lennon responding to his Beatles were bigger than Jesus comment, which I believe was completely scripted. Lennon's remarks were not off the cuff, but intentionally expressed as part of the agenda to marginalize institutionalized religion, in this case, Christianity. The third clip is Lennon again, where we hear him saying that by the year 2012, or by the beginning of the age of Aquarius, Paul will be Jesus. This is in reference to the religion of Paulism, which is a Luciferian cult involving the Beatles, where biological Paul McCartney is considered a graven Christ figure who died and was resurrected and brought back to life via Billy Shears. If you are not familiar with this concept, I will leave a link in the description box below where I explain it in greater detail. Let's take a listen. Great friend of mine, Mr. Derek Taylor, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Welcome to the show, Derek. Thank you very much, Jules. Now, um, why have they decided finally to document their pasts? Well, I think that after all those years, 25 years, they felt that there might be um, some interest in it. And this thing took off suddenly about a year ago. It looked as if they were on time again. And by now, we're in the middle of a tidal wave. We're engulfed. When did you first start being their <laughs> press officer? In 1964. I saw them in 63, fell for them, decided this was a wonderful thing, that they shone a light on the world. Yes. And I would like to get in the light. <laughs> I'd be illuminated by it. Yes. That they shone a light on the world. Yes. And I would like to get in the light. <laughs> I'd be illuminated by it. Yes. The Beatles now, um, are they happy with the outcome of the film? Yes, I think they're happy with each other. They're happy to, that uh, they're, they're, I don't want to be pathetic, but they're re reunited with John on this very good record. And once again, they illuminate our life. And once again, they illuminate our life. So, well, Derek, thank you very much thank <clears> for you. joining us. Derek Taylor, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. The Beatles arrived in Japan today as their tour of the Far East continues. Across the Pacific, in the United States, a furor is developing over comments John Lennon made. Quote, Christianity will go. It will vanish and shrink. We're more popular than Jesus. Unquote. Here in Tokyo, violence broke out when right-wing fanatics demonstrated against the Beatles and their effect on Japanese youth. This is Tommy Charles. If you, as an American teenager, are offended by statements from a group of foreign singers which strike at the very basis of our existence as God-fearing, patriotic citizens, then we urge you to take your Beatle records, pictures, and souvenirs to the pickup point about to be named 
And on the night of the Beatles' appearance in Memphis, August 19th, they will be destroyed in a huge public bonfire at a place to be named soon. Stay tuned to Wacky for further development. Now, this religious controversy, I know you don't want to say too much about it, but does it worry that it's going to boil up when you get to the States? Well, it worries me, yes, but I, I hope everything will be all right in the end of the day. Well, I think, I think the Beatles are a real talented group, but I think that they need to watch what they say because they're in such a position that a, a lot of teenagers really think of them as something really big. And, and when they say things like that, some teenagers are going to just believe anything they say. No, but I'm not saying that we're better or greater or comparing us with Jesus Christ as a person or God as a thing or whatever it is. You know, I just said what I said and it was wrong or was taken wrong and now it's all this. Did you mean that the Beatles are more popular than Christ? Uh, when I was talking about it, it was very close and intimate with this person that I know who happens to be a reporter. And I was using expressions on things that I just read and derived from, about Christianity, only I was saying it in the simplest form that I know, which is the natural way I talk. What's the most enjoyable thing to you for about this adulation, this almost uh, godhood on earth that you've achieved? Don't say that. <laughs> they burned their records and spit on their images. But before they burned the records, they had to buy them. We meant more to kids than Jesus did. I was just saying it as a fact. I was using expressions on things that I just read. The Passover plot speculates that the Bible is a hoax and that Jesus didn't die on the cross. Jesus survived and in order to create a new religion with himself as the Messiah, he made people believe that he'd risen from the dead. He said to me once that the children of 2000 will be listening to the Beatles. By 2012, the masses would be where we are today, and Paul should be Jesus by then. By 2012, the masses would be where we are today, and Paul should be Jesus by then. Now let's take a closer look at Theodore Adorno and Willis Harmon to understand their philosophies and ideologies. As I presented in a previous slide, Adorno was a German philosopher, sociologist, psychologist, and a highly skilled composer known for his critical theory of society. Adorno actually planned on a career as a composer, but decided on philosophy. He was a leading member of the Frankfurt School, which rejected capitalism and promoted socialism. He also rejected traditional metaphysics. Adorno was influenced by Hegel, Marx, and Nietzsche. He believed that capitalist-driven mass media and mass culture appealed to the lowest common denominator in pursuit of maximum profit. He was critical of jazz and pop music, which he believed was part of the culture that sustains capitalism. Adorno identified popular culture as a reason why people become passive. He believed the easy pleasures available through consumption of popular culture made people docile and content, no matter how terrible their economic circumstances. He felt that the entertainment industry of modern society is just as mechanical, formulaic, and dominating as the workplace. He argued that humans in modern society are programmed at work and in their leisure, and although they seek to escape the monotony of their workplace, they are merely moving to another piece of the machine, for example, from producer at work to consumer at home. Adorno also believed that under the current system, there is no chance of becoming a free individual who can take part in the creation of society, whether at work or play. When Adorno came to the United States, he was both fascinated and repelled by the consumer culture. He outlined three ways capitalism degrades and corrupts. Number one, Adorno claimed that within the culture industry, the leisure time of people becomes toxic. He believed free time should be used to expand and develop ourselves in order to change society for the better. Number two, 
He also believed that capitalism does not sell us things we really need, and our real wants are shielded from us by the system. He claimed that humans settle for manufactured desires when what they really need is tenderness, understanding, calm, insight, and community. Number three, he believed fascist beliefs are embedded within society. To prove this, Adorno designed a questionnaire called the F scale, or the fascist scale, which he distributed to every school in West Germany. The questionnaire assessed responses to statements such as, obedience and respect for authority are the most important virtues children should learn, and if people would talk less and work more, people would be better off, along with, when a person has a problem or worry, it's best for him not to think about it, but to keep busy with more cheerful things. Based on his research, Adorno concluded the population at large suffers from psychological frailties. Adorno was a left-wing thinker who believed the primary obstacles to social progress are cultural and psychological rather than political or economic. He believed there was enough money, resources, time, and skills to house people, to provide fulfilling work, to foster community support, as well as not destroying the environment. He believed the reason for suffering and people hurting one another is because our minds are sick, meaning brainwashed and conditioned. He believed the pursuit of freedom in society is inseparable from the pursuit of enlightenment in culture. I found Adorno's philosophy aligned very well with Tavistock's social engineering agenda to break down the dogma of traditional society and culture, which includes the political and economic systems, as well as institutionalized religious beliefs. Also, the word enlightenment comes up often when researching players like Theodore Adorno and Willis Harmon. We also find this with a book related to the memoirs of Billy Shears called Beatles Enlightenment, where the memoirs website states, If you enjoy books by illuminaries such as Deepak Chopra, Wayne Dyer, Eckhart Tolle, Ram Dass, or Marianne Williamson, you will love reading some of their favorite concepts behind Beatles songs. The site goes on to say, The book takes the reader deeper into the philosophical and spiritually esoteric behind the Beatles and their music. And note, the website did not say luminaries such as Deepak Chopra and Eckhart Tolle, but illuminaries, as in illuminated, just like Derek Taylor's comment from earlier in the presentation. Hopefully it's becoming clear how this all ties together and is a massive initiative designed and orchestrated by the Committee of 300 and Tavistock to fundamentally alter the course of human consciousness and thinking. And as a side note, Please note Theodore Adorno was born on September 11th, or 9-11, and he died at age 65, or just short of his 66th birthday. All of these numbers have occult meaning. Now let's discuss Willis Harmon. As stated earlier, Willis Harmon was an American engineer, futurist, and author associated with the human potential movement. He had a master's in physics and a Ph.D. in electrical engineering from Stanford University. He also taught at the University of Florida and at Stanford. He was heavily involved with the Stanford Research Institute, or SRI, which is a part of the military, industrial, and technology complex, folding in under the Tavistock umbrella. He was the president of the Institute of Noetic Sciences, or IONS, for 20 years. IONS is an American nonprofit parapsychological research institute. Noetics is a branch of metaphysical philosophy concerned with the study of mind as well as intellect. Harmon was the co-founder of the World Business Academy, or WBA, which is a non-profit think tank and action incubator that explores the role of business in relation to critical moral, environmental, and social issues of our time. Harmon was convinced Western culture was facing a spiritual and moral crisis stemming from the ravages of industrialism and its economic logic, which he came to call the world macro problem. Regarding noetics, Mr. Harmon was quoted as saying, A noetic science, a science of consciousness and the world of inner experience, is the most promising contemporary framework within which to carry on that fundamental moral inquiry which stable human societies have always had to place at the center of their concerns. We can see Mr. Adorno and Mr. Harmon had a lot in common with regard to their philosophies and ideologies. Both men were very focused on human potential, believing it was shackled and sub-optimized by the current societal and cultural systems. Here we see an organizational chart showing the main cogs in the controlling apparatus, 
with the Committee of 300 sitting at the top. In the boxed area, we have the Institute for Social Research directly linked to Tavistock, and within the Institute for Social Research's purview is the Stanford Research Institute, along with the Princeton Institute for Advanced Studies and the Harvard Psychiatric Clinic. Also connected into Tavistock is MIT, the National Training Laboratories, the Wharton School of Economics, the Hudson Institute, the Brookings Institute, the Rand Corporation, the Club of Rome, etc. Both Adorno and Harmon were deeply connected into the Tavistock network, and there is no doubt in my mind that both men knew each other and in all likelihood were working together or in parallel to implement the many facets of the agenda. Like the old saying goes, it's a small world, especially within the elite circles. Adorno and Harmon shared three very key philosophies. One, the traditional system is oppressive and unenlightening. Two, humans need to evolve to higher levels of functioning and consciousness. Three, to do this, steering or engineering was required to push the agenda forward and achieve the desired outcomes and social change. All of these principles align perfectly with Tavistock and the concepts behind the human potential movement, the Aquarian conspiracy, and the New Age movement. In order to facilitate the change and manifest a new reality, tools are needed to implement the vision. The tools would come in the form of the Beatles, the British Invasion, the Summer of Love, the Monterey Pop Festival, the Psychedelic Era, the Drug Culture, Free Love, Woodstock, and the entire portfolio of Aquarian players and events. One of the most powerful tools the controllers have in their toolbox is the entertainment and music industries, which they completely own. And so in 1962, Tavistock primed the pump with the Beatles in order to set a new course for humanity, one that would fundamentally change the world. Now let's dig into Dr. Coleman's claims regarding the Beatles and Tavistock. The Beatles drew large emotional crowds, charmed the New York press, and as in London four months earlier, appeared on a national television broadcast that brought them into nearly every living room in the country. Now, yesterday and today, our theater's been jammed with newspapermen and hundreds of photographers from all over the nation, and these veterans agree with me that the city never has witnessed the excitement stirred by these youngsters from Liverpool who call themselves the Beatles. Now, tonight, you're going to twice be entertained by them. Right now, and again in the second half of our show, ladies and gentlemen, the Beatles! I think that um, the great thing about the Beatles is that they were of their time. Their timing was right. They didn't choose it. Someone chose it for them. But, um... The timing was right, and they left their mark in history because of it. In the next two slides, I will read the main excerpts from the 1992 edition of Dr. Coleman's book that have to do with the Beatles. Then I will spend some time looking into Coleman's statements on atonal music and whether I believe Theodore Adorno was writing the Beatles' music and lyrics, as well as looking into an internet claim that Adorno once owned the publishing rights to the Beatles' songs page 88 and 89. As in the case of gang wars, nothing could or would have been accomplished without the cooperation of the media, especially the electronic media, and in particular, the scurrilous Ed Sullivan, who had been coached by the conspirators as to the role he was to play. Nobody would have paid much attention to the motley crew from Liverpool and the 12 atonal system of music that was to follow had it not been for an overabundance of press exposure. The 12 atonal system consisted of heavy, repetitive sounds taken from the music of the cult of Dionysus and Baal priesthood by Adorno and given a modern flavor by this special friend of the Queen of England and hence the Committee of 300. Tavistock and its Stanford Research Center created trigger words which then came into general usage around rock music and its fans. Trigger words created a distinct, new, breakaway, largely young population group which was persuaded by social engineering and conditioning to believe that the Beatles really were their favorite group. All trigger words devised in the context of rock music were designed from mass control of the new targeted group, the Youth of America. The Beatles did a perfect job, or perhaps it would be more correct to say that Tavistock and Stanford did a perfect job, the Beatles merely reacting like trained robots with a little help from their friends, code words for using drugs and making it cool. The Beatles became a highly visible new type, more Tavistock jargon, and as such, it was not long before the group made new styles, fads in clothing, hairstyles, and language usage, 
which upset the older generations, as was intended. This was part of the fragmentation maladaptation process worked out by Willis Harmon and his team of social scientists and genetic engineering tinkerers and put into action. From page 94, without massive media hype and without almost around-the-clock coverage, the hippie beatnik rock drug culture would never have gotten off the ground. It would have remained a localized oddity. The Beatles, with their twanging guitars, silly expressions, drug language, and weird clothes, would not have amounted to a hill of beans. Instead, because the Beatles were given saturation coverage by the media, the United States has suffered one culture shock after another. From page 96 and 97, Ed Sullivan was sent to England to become acquainted with the first Tavistock Institute rock group to hit the shores of the United States. Sullivan then returned to the United States to draft the strategy for the electronic media on how to package and sell the group. Without the full cooperation of the electronic media and Ed Sullivan in particular, the Beatles and their music would have died on the vine. Instead, our national life and the character of the United States was forever changed. Now that we know, it is all too clear how successful the Beatles' campaign to proliferate the use of drugs became. The fact that the Beatles had their music and lyrics written for them by Theo Adorno was concealed from public view. The prime function of the Beatles was to be discovered by teenagers who were then subjected to a non-stop barrage of Beatle music until they became convinced that they liked the sound and adopted it, along with all that accompanied it. The Liverpool group performed up to expectations, and with a little help from their friends, i.e. illegal substances we call drugs, created a whole new class of young Americans in the precise mold ordained by the Tavistock Institute. In the excerpts I just read, Dr. Coleman asserts Tavistock created the Beatles, Theodore Adorno wrote their music and lyrics, and the music is atonal. Based on my own independent research, and what I have presented thus far regarding the Beatles, including the information on the Committee of 300, Tavistock, and their human potential movement, I believe that Dr. Coleman's claim that Tavistock created the Beatles is correct. But did Theodore Adorno personally write the Beatles' music and lyrics, and is the music atonal? To understand if these claims are true, we will take a closer look into Adorno as well as atonal music to see if we can validate Dr. Coleman's position. As a side note, I did try to reach Dr. Coleman to interview him for this presentation, but I did not receive a response. He is 84 years old, so it's very possible that he is no longer doing interviews. I will leave a link in the description box below, which contains lectures and radio shows Dr. Coleman appeared on to talk about his research and his book. Let's move to the next slide. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, Adorno was born on September 11, 1903, and was a philosopher, sociologist, psychologist, and composer known for his critical theory of society. Although Adorno's resume was diverse, his primary focus was on philosophy and his work in academia. He was the director of the Institute for Social Research at the University of Frankfurt from 1956 until his death in 1969, and he was a strong advocate of socialism. He was a prolific writer of essays and books which critiqued the modern capitalist society, which he referred to as the culture industry. His writings also included his philosophies on music theory. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, Adorno became a public figure through his books and essays and also via his radio and newspaper appearances. His time was occupied with writing, lecturing, teaching, traveling, and composing. Thus, Adorno had a very busy schedule. Also, he was 59 years old when the Beatles emerged in 1962 and 65 when he died in 1969 from a heart attack, approximately one month before the Beatles released Abbey Road. So the question becomes, when did a man in his 60s, with the schedule he was keeping, have time to personally write 237 original songs for the Beatles? If we are questioning whether Lennon and McCartney could accomplish this feat, then it's fair game to ask the same question about Theodore Adorno. Now some might say, but Adorno's musical training and skills far exceeded those of Lennon and McCartney, but we have to weigh his expertise in composing against the time he had available considering the other aspects of his schedule, which would have been quite demanding. I believe if Adorno was involved with the Beatles, it could possibly have been in an oversight capacity, 
where he was part of a committee responsible for overseeing the formulation and evolution of the Beatles as a social and cultural change agent. This oversight could conceivably include the use of composers and songwriters on the EMI staff or within the Tavistock network who were employed to write the Beatles' music according to direction given by Adorno, George Martin, and social scientists such as Willis Harmon who were involved in the Beatles' project. Therefore, given Adorno's other commitments, I believe it is unlikely he was personally writing the music and lyrics for the Beatles. Now let's talk about atonal music. In Dr. Coleman's book, he states, The 12 atonal system consisted of heavy, repetitive sounds taken from the music of the cult of Dionysus and Baal priesthood. So what is atonal music? Atonal music is a general term used to define music that seems to lack a clear tonal center, for example, a musical key. Composer Arnold Schoenberg is generally seen as the first composer to fully embrace atonality. With atonal music, highly dissonant chords are far more common and thus many listeners who are used to traditional tonality may find atonal music challenging to listen to, at least until they get used to it. Nearly all music in the Western classical tradition is considered tonal. That is, its harmonic structure is primarily triadic and hierarchically organized around a prominent tonal center, for example, a musical key. One way to identify the tonal center for a song, aside from the key it is in, is to look at the first and last chord of a piece of music. There is a high probability that one or both of those chords is the main chord, and that the root of that chord is the tonal center of the song. For instance, in my life begins and ends with an A chord. Thus, the tonal center for in my life is A, and the rest of the song is built around that tonal center. However, atonal music tends to deny or expand this notion by using alternative structural strategies, frequently but not exclusively mathematical, with the most famous referred to as serialism. As we have discussed, Theodore Adorno was an accomplished composer and clearly understood atonal and tonal music structures, but Beatle music is not atonal, it is tonal. So why did Dr. Coleman refer to the Beatles' music as atonal? It's possible Coleman was expressing a personal dislike for rock music with its rhythmic backbeat and repetitive structure in the form of a song's verse, bridge, and in particular the chorus, which is usually the hook of the song. The hook is that part of the song which people like to sing along to, think in terms of, we all live in a yellow submarine. Beatles songs that I thought contained some atonal moments or dissonance might be the crescendo in A Day in a Life, Revolution No. 9 with its avant-garde tape splicing, and the piano at the very end of Magical Mystery Tour. But none of these songs in themselves are atonal. They are tonal with a tonal center. And because a song might have some dissonance here and there, those moments do not necessarily make the song atonal. In a moment, I will play examples of atonal music which might help to better understand what atonal music sounds like. But before I do that, one of our team members is an accomplished composer and here is what they had to say on the topic. The atonal approach puts no restrictions or limits on your work. Anything goes. Beatle music was never atonal. There was occasional dissonance in Beatles songs, but this was not a studied attempt for atonality. Beatle music can be described as following in the classical European tradition. The fundamental scale and tuning are the starting point. Add some American blues, R&B, folk and country music influences, and the mix is complete. There is a structure to classical tonal pieces by the great German composers. Bach and Beethoven, for example, follow their own self-imposed constraints. For three lads in their early 20s, all this composing and music production was way out of their reach. The composer of the McCartney songs pre-September 1966 is a different person or persons from the post-1966 period. There are clearly stylistic differences. More than one brain was at work in the creation of the songs ascribed to Paul, apart from Lennon. The person or persons who wrote Another Girl, The Night Before, and I'm Looking Through You are not the same combination who wrote Michelle, Yesterday, or Eleanor Rigby. There are subtle differences in both style and delivery. And now, here are examples of Adorno's atonal compositions.
There is an internet thread which has made the rounds 
which states Theodore Adorno held the rights to the Beatles' music, saying, Theodore Adorno was the brains behind the Beatles as he held the rights to the music and eventually his estate sold those rights to Michael Jackson. There was no citation I could find to confirm the statement. So one of our team members did the research to see if this claim could be validated. This was done by taking a look at the history of the royalty flow of Beatles songs. Our colleague stated, The available data does not support the flow of royalties which would confirm Adorno was directly involved in writing the Beatle compositions. But, our team member also stated, the royalty flow, especially with the Beatles' early material, is confusing, meaning the audit trail expected to be there was not, which we found interesting. Therefore, based on our own independent research, we determined this claim to be inconclusive. And now, let's summarize Part 5 of this presentation. Dr. Coleman's book is an accurate depiction of the controlling apparatus. The lack of citations in his book can be explained as the result of secretive knowledge and information Dr. Coleman knew about as a result of his work as an intelligence officer, information that would not be found or published in the public domain. Subsequent to Coleman's book, many other alternative researchers have confirmed the existence of the deep state structure. Coleman's book also asserts the Beatlesbury Tavistock Project, and Tavistock and its affiliates, including the Stanford Research Institute, or SRI, are in the business of social engineering and mind control. However, I found Coleman's assertion that Theodore Adorno wrote all the Beatles' music to be inconclusive. Adorno's schedule of writing, lecturing, teaching, traveling, and composing was demanding, and thus, time to personally compose 237 original Beatles songs from 1962 through 1969 appears suspect. Also, Adorno's age is a factor in the equation. He would have been in his 60s during the Beatle timeline. However, all this does not preclude the premise that others with Adorno's ideology from the Frankfurt School or the Human Potential Movement from being directly involved in the Beatles' music or Adorno himself acting in an oversight capacity. Assertions found on the Internet that Adorno owned the rights to the Beatles' music could not be substantiated. There is no citation or publishing audit trail to prove or disprove this claim. Adorno and Willis Harmon were prominent social engineers who operated within the Committee of 300 Enterprise via Tavistock and the Stanford Research Institute. Adorno and Harmon were strong advocates of the human potential movement. Both promoted changing the current culture and society. This was done through Tavistock's network of organizations like the Esalen Institute and initiatives such as the Human Potential Movement, the Aquarian Conspiracy, and the New Age Movement. The Beatles played a huge role in Tavistock's rollout of the New Agenda, which became known as the Aquarian Conspiracy, which included the Psychedelic Era, the Summer of Love, the Monterey Pop Festival, Woodstock, the Drug Culture, and Free Love. Based on the research presented, the Beatles can be logically linked to the Committee of 300 and Tavistock's Social Engineering Agenda. Now let's move to Part 6 of the presentation. What actually happened was that when Ringo came to the session for the first time, nobody told me that he was coming. I'd already booked Andy White, and I told Brian Epstein I was going to do this. I said, I just want the three others, and that's fine. Ringo turns up expecting to play. I said, well, you know, I've been bidden once. I'm not going to have that. I don't even know who you are. Mm. We're going to have Andy White. Thank you very much. No, I was devastated. I came down ready to roll, and... Uh... We've got Andy White, the professional drummer. <laughs> oh dear, that's all. Yeah, uh, but he's apologised several times <laughs> since as old George Martin. But it was, it was devastating. And then we did that, which, which Andy plays on, and then we did the album, which I play on. You know, so Andy wasn't doing anything so great. Well, he wasn't doing anything so great I couldn't copy when we did the album. Oh, Ringo to this day bears those scars. He says, you know, you didn't let me play, did you? I, I really despised the way we couldn't ever make a decision for ourselves. It was always like, no, sorry. No, but Ringo must go with us. Sorry, we'll get a new drummer. And Jimmy Nichol was a very good drummer who came along and learned Ringo's parts very well. And obviously he had to rehearse with them and uh, got to know the songs very well. You're on, Jimmy. Where, whether you find it difficult to take over the role of Ringo. Uh, 
No, not really. No. <laughs> They remembered that they were four individuals, you see. We believed the Beatles myth too. You know. I don't know whether the others still believe it, but you know. But as soon as we made it, we made it. The, 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 the edges were knocked off. You now Brian put us in suits and all that, and we made it very, very big, but we sold out. You know. And the music was dead before we even went on the theatre tour of Britain. We were, we, were, we were feeling shit already because we had to reduce an hour or two hours playing, which we were glad in one way to 20 minutes and go on and repeat the same 20 minutes every night. The Beatles music died then as, as musicians. That's why we never improved, you know, as musicians. We killed ourselves then to make it. And that was the end of it. And uh, George and I are more inclined to say that, you know. We always miss the club days because that's when we were playing music. And then later on, we became technically efficient recording artists, which was another thing because we were competent people, you know, and we can, whatever media you put us in, we can produce something worthwhile. You know. how, do you, how do you rate yourself as a guitar musician? Uh, well, it depends what kind of guitarist, you know. I'm okay. You know. I can't, I'm not technically very good, but I can make it fucking howl, you know, and move. I was rhythm guitarist, you know, and it's, it's an important job. I can make a, a band drive, you know. How do you rate George? Uh, he's pretty good. You know. <laughs> I prefer myself, you know, I have to be honest, you know. I mean, I'm really very embarrassed about my guitar playing in one way because it's, it's very poor, you know, I can never move. Yeah, but I can make a guitar speak, yeah. you know. Used to do it like we used to have Brian Jones on, you know my name, a Beatle number. He's, you know, he's playing on that, playing sax. You know, but in those days you couldn't tell. You weren't supposed to tell. So we'd have a lot of people on our sessions, the Beatle sessions, and nobody'd know who was on because we weren't allowed to tell. In part six, we will look into clues of what might have gone on behind the scenes that differs from the mainstream Beatle narrative. We will start with a look into drummers Andy White, and then move to Bernard Purdy, who caused quite a stir 40 years ago when he claimed he was hired to drum on 21 Beatles songs. Then we will talk about a Quincy Jones interview where he rendered his opinion on the playing abilities of Ringo Starr and Paul McCartney. We will then dive into some other articles which shine additional light on the Beatles and their level of musical skill, including Billy recording tracks on Sgt. Pepper that we have been led to believe were being played by John and George. Then we will finish up this segment with a recommendation on a documentary which takes us through how the music business works and who is really playing on the songs of your favorite artist or band. This is a cheat sheet article from October 2019, which presents some very revealing information. The article says, The Beatles were not virtuoso musicians, and they were usually the first to admit it. When John Lennon spoke to Playboy's David Sheff in 1980, he put it this way, Not technically great. None of us were technical musicians none of us could read music. In 1977, George Harrison spoke about how his guitar technique slipped in the late 60s. It was pretty simple. He stopped playing guitar for three years to focus on the sitar. When he picked up his guitar again, he focused on slide because he felt, quote, so far behind in playing hot licks, close quote. As for Paul McCartney, the best all-around musician in the band, he spoke of how difficult it was for him to play the piano riff on Martha My Dear. That leaves Ringo, a drummer who refused to take a solo until the last track of the band's last studio album. The article goes on to say, Usually, the band could nail down parts when they needed to, but there were moments when the lack of technique got in the way. George's aborted guitar solo on Taxman was one example. And of course, the mainstream narrative tells us that the guitar solo on Taxman was played by Paul McCartney. The article continues, Another moment came during the Abbey Road sessions, when John got on Ringo's case for his drumming. And we will talk more about Ringo in the next few slides. So here we have a mainstream article telling us the Beatles were not great musicians. And I have played clips of John Lennon telling us the very same thing. Now let's dig a little more into George Martin's initial take on Ringo's playing abilities. Here's another article from Cheat Sheet dated July of 2019. This one is interesting because up until this point, we were told Ringo did not play on Love Me Do and P.S. I Love You because he was a late add to the Beatles lineup, and George Martin had already hired Andy White, a professional session drummer, to fill in 
after Pete Best was let go. However, this article says the following. When Ringo replaced Pete Best in 1962, he naturally expected to record with the band at their first session at EMI with producer George Martin. But Martin did not consider Ringo ready after hearing him play the drums. Which is interesting, because as we covered earlier in the presentation, Martin fired Pete Best for the very same reason. The article continues, That meant Ringo played the tambourine while a session drummer hired by Martin worked with the band. And the dings to Ringo's ego didn't stop there. In 1966, when Jeff Emmerich became the Beatles' engineer for Revolver, he noticed Paul directing Ringo on the drums for Tomorrow Never Knows. The article continues, Following the death of Beatles manager Brian Epstein, Emmerich saw Paul's coaching, all the way down to banging a tambourine so Ringo could keep time. So the story that Ringo did not play on Love Me Do and P.S. I Love You because he was late to the party has been changed. Based on this article, he did not play because George Martin, after hearing Ringo play, decided he was not ready, or perhaps not at the level required to do studio work. We are also being told McCartney was directing Ringo on drums and banging a tambourine to help him keep time. This is very odd for someone who was supposedly a competent drummer. A thought I had when I read this piece is whether the Paul we are talking about here is actually Billy. If we recall earlier in the presentation, Billy said he wrote the music to In My Life. I suggested this might be a clue of Billy being behind the scenes prior to 1967. And now we're reading, Paul was tutoring Ringo on the drumming of Tomorrow Never Knows, a psychedelic song on the Beatles' seventh album, Revolver, which was released in August of 1966. Now here's the thing. Biological Paul was not a drummer. But Billy, on the other hand, is very capable behind the drum kit. Now let's listen to a clip from the documentary titled Produced by George Martin, where Billy is talking with George and making the comment that Martin was used to working with professional session drummers and Ringo was not precise. You know, he, he was not precise, and so you, I think you were used to working with session drummers who were yeah. on the ball. And what happened in the Beatles, you know, when we played live, if Ringo sped up a tiny bit, we all just yeah. went with him. Yeah. So you, nobody really noticed it. So who is Andy White? Andy was a Scottish drummer and primarily a session musician. He is best known for replacing Ringo Starr on drums on the Beatles' first single, Love Me Do. White was featured on the American 45 RPM release of the song, which also appeared on the band's debut British album, Please Please Me. He also played on P.S. I Love You, which was the B-side of Love Me Do. And he also played with Herman's Hermits, Tom Jones, Rod Stewart, the BBC's Scottish Radio Orchestra, and the Smithereens. But now let's take a look into Bernard Purdy, who made some extraordinary claims, saying he was the drummer on 21 Beatles songs, and based on his 2014 book, Let the Drum Speak, it's a claim he still stands by. Bernard Lee Pretty Purdy was born on June 11, 1939, and is an American drummer who was considered an influential R&B, soul, and funk musician. He was inducted into the Martin Drummer Hall of Fame in 2013. Purdy is known for his precise musical timekeeping and his signature use of triplets against a halftime backbeat which has been dubbed the Purdy Shuffle. Back in 1978, and in subsequent interviews, which we will cover in a moment, Purdy claimed to be the drummer on 21 Beatles songs. But before we get into his claims, let's take a moment and listen to a clip of Bernard showing us the Purdy Shuffle. Listen closely, and see if you don't hear this drumming technique in many of the early Beatles songs. Now, now that we've got the 12-4 and the 12-8, I'm going to explain to you, remember that word, called explain. Not explain, but I'm going to explain to you what the Purdy Shuffle is all about. going to surprise you. It's quarters. <laughs> it's eights. It's 16. It's dotted. And it's also triplets. (laughs) 
didn't know that, did you? But you want to know something else? It's also half notes, which brings about half time. And you can also add to that a whole note. And I'm going to explain to you by playing it all. Ooh. <laughs> now, we're going to have a little fun with this to let you know that they all work together when you put them together. And as long as you groove. Bernard Purdy is arguably the most recorded drummer in the world. He had a 25-year association with Aretha Franklin. He also worked with Lonnie Youngblood, King Curtis, Les Cooper, Paul Butterfield, Larry Coryell, Miles Davis, Hall & Oates, Al Cooper, Herbie Mann, Todd Rudgren, Isaac Hayes, Donny Hathaway, B.B. King, Joe Cocker, Jeff Beck, Alan Jackson, Cat Stevens, and many other artists as well as regularly producing his own solo albums. Purdy also anchored sessions with the Rolling Stones, James Brown, and Tom Jones. He drummed on Steely Dan's Asia and played on Steely Dan's Babylon Sisters. Purdy is credited on the 1978 soundtrack album for Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band featuring Peter Frampton and the Bee Gees. His discography contains over 3,000 recordings. Bernard also claims to have overdubbed the drumming on a few Tony Sheridan recordings. Sheridan and the Beatles, also known as the Beat Brothers, recorded My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean, The Saints, Why, Nobody's Child, and Take Out Some Insurance. The single, My Bonnie, was released in Germany in October of 1961 and was a moderate success, peaking at number 32 in the national chart published in Der Music Market, number 11 in the national jukebox charts, and number four in a local Hamburg chart. In a 1978 interview, Purdy claimed to have added drum overdubs to several tracks of the Beatles' Hamburg recordings with Tony Sheridan, including Ain't She Sweet, Take Out Some Insurance on Me, and Sweet Georgia Brown, to give them a punchier sound for the U.S. market. In the February 1978 issue of Gig Magazine, Purdy claimed he was hired by Brian Epstein to do some overdubbing 
and at the time he had never heard of the Beatles. He told Gig Magazine that Epstein hired him to overdub the drumming on 21 tracks, covering the Beatles' first three albums, Please Please Me, With the Beatles, and A Hard Day's Night. Purdy claimed he was paid five figures by Epstein and told the money was for playing and to keep his mouth shut. To do the overdub, he says he listened to what Ringo played and then overdubbed on top of Ringo's track, and that the only people in the studio, aside from himself, was the engineer, Brian Epstein, and a few of Epstein's people. Purdy states in the article, he didn't think George Martin was aware and that Brian Epstein was the focal point. Now, the claim that George Martin was not aware is impossible. George Martin had to know. It is possible that Ringo did initially drum on the songs, but with the EMI recording team knowing his track would be redone by a session drummer. This scenario allows them to say Ringo drummed on the songs without having to say he was not on the final recording. However, the problem with the scenario is this. A drummer is instrumental in keeping the tempo or time signature of a song together. If the drummer is not very consistent with their ability to keep time, then the band and the recording can suffer. In fact, starting in the 1980s through today, a drummer's ability to keep time is so important that many producers won't use a drummer who cannot drum to a click track, which is like a metronome that measures in beats per minute. So in my opinion, it's unlikely that Ringo was drumming on any of these songs to begin with. If we go back to George Martin hiring Andy White and the Cheat Sheet article I covered earlier, we were told George Martin was not impressed with Ringo's drumming. And if this was the case, then why would Martin use Ringo on the first three albums? It seems more likely Martin was intending to use session drummers from the very beginning, and Bernard Purdy was one of those musicians, just like Andy White. Now let's take a look at other comments Bernard made in 1984, 85, 2008, and in 2010. In an excerpt from Max Weinberg's 1984 book, The Big Beat, Purdy said the following, Weinberg, you played on Beatle tracks? Purdy, 21 of them. Weinberg, do you remember which ones? Purdy, mmm. Weinberg, which ones? Purdy, that information I don't disclose. Weinberg, why won't you name the tracks? Purdy, because if I need that information to get me some money, then I'll have what's necessary. I also played on songs by the animals and the monkeys. Weinberg, everyone knows the monkeys were a fabricated band, but the Beatles? Purdy, Ringo never played on anything. Weinberg, Ringo never played on anything? Purdy, not the early Beatles stuff. In a Drum Magazine interview from 1985, the interviewer asked, When will you reveal the titles of those Beatle tracks? Purdy, I'm in the process now of writing the book. I will tell you this much. There's 21 tracks that I played on. The other thing I can say is Ringo is not on anything. The interviewer, nothing? Purdy, nothing. Then in a 2008 interview on Pod Show Radio, the interviewer asked, The word is that you played on the first three Beatles albums and that Ringo did not play on any of them. Is that true? Purdy. Well, it's true, but the point is that I'm going to leave that alone for the time being because every time I open my mouth about it, I've gotten myself into trouble. But I think my book will satisfy a lot of people because we dealt with it in a nice way, and people can make their own judgment. And then in 2010, Purdy said the following, What I did was fix the Beatles records. I fixed. Playing with them? No. What I did was fix their records so their records worked. I did 21 tracks fixing it up before they even came over here. I didn't know who the Beatles were. I didn't know anything. It was just records that I was fixing. They didn't give me any information. The man paid me to come in and fix these tracks. Bernard Purdy did release his book in 2014. In Chapter 20, titled The Ringo Star Controversy, Purdy again explains how it went down and Bernard's story stays consistent. The book tells us, he was called in to overdub the drummer on 21 tracks. He was paid for his contribution and to keep his mouth shut, which he did for 15 years. When some of Purdy's students held Starr up as one of the greatest drummers, Purdy told his students it was he who played on the early Beatles recordings. And he tells us his comments over the years have stirred up a hornet's nest. He received hate mail, death threats, and ridicule. But was there quiet vindication? The 1978 film 
Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band featured the Bee Gees, Peter Frampton, and Purdy on drums. And George Martin served as musical director, conductor, arranger, and producer of the film's soundtrack album. It's quite a story. For those who are not familiar with Quincy Jones, he is an American record producer, multi-instrumentalist, songwriter, composer, arranger, and film and television producer. His career spans over 60 years in the entertainment industry with a record 80 Grammy Award nominations, 28 Grammys, and a Grammy Legend Award in 1992. Jones's resume is extensive, working with artists such as Michael Jackson, Lionel Hampton, Ray Charles, Count Basie, Frank Sinatra, Eddie Van Halen, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., and many more. Needless to say, Quincy has worked with the very best. In a February 2018 Spin Magazine interview, he caused quite a stir when he said the Beatles were no playing motherfuckers. In the interview, he says, They were the worst musicians in the world. They were no playing motherfuckers. Paul was the worst bass player I ever heard. And Ringo? Don't even talk about it. Then Jones recounted a recording session he participated in for Ringo's 1970 solo debut, Sentimental Journey. Quincy tells us, I remember once we were in the studio with George Martin, and Ringo had taken three hours for a four-bar thing he was trying to fix on a song. He couldn't get it. We said, Mate, why don't you get some lager and lime, some shepherd's pie, and take an hour and a half and break a little bit? So he did, and we called Ronnie Varel, a jazz drummer. Ronnie came in for 15 minutes and tore it up. Ringo comes back and says, George, can you play it back for me one more time? So George did. And Ringo says, that didn't sound so bad. And I said, yeah, motherfucker, because it ain't you. Great guy, though. After the interview was published, the PR damage control went into overdrive, and the mainstream press then published articles saying Quincy phoned McCartney, a.k.a. Billy, to apologize. They reportedly kissed and made up. Now, whether Quincy was referring to the bass playing of Biological Paul or Billy is unknown, or maybe he was referring to both of them. The interesting thing about the apology is he never actually retracted what he said. He just apologized for bad-mouthing. He didn't say, I was wrong about the Beatles. They were and are great musicians. But if you ask me, Quincy, who was known for his frankness, was giving an honest assessment in his typical colorful way. From a January 2020 cheat sheet article, we are told Ringo had trouble getting the drums down for Polythene Pam and tells a similar story as Quincy Jones. John made a crack about Ringo's drum part on Polythene Pam. Ringo took that criticism to heart and asked to have another go at the song's backing track. John vetoed the idea, but Ringo decided he would put in the extra time later and record the drum part on his own. Jeff Emmerich, the Beatles' longtime engineer, said this laborious process took many hours to do. Since the release of the White Album, we have been led to believe Ringo drummed on the song Don't Pass Me By, a song he allegedly wrote. In fact, many mainstream sources will still tell us Ringo was the drummer. I remember reading an article a while back where it was divulged that Billy played the drums on Don't Pass Me By and Ringo played piano. I could not find the article I read but I did find a mainstream Beatles source, Beatlesbooks.com, and they mentioned Billy played drums on the song and not Ringo. The website says, According to Kevin Hallett's track-by-track -track section in the book accompanying the Super Deluxe White Album box set, Ringo was on piano and Paul, or Billy, on drums. For those who are unaware, other Beatles songs Billy drummed on include Back in the USSR, Dear Prudence, Martha My Dear, the Ballad of John and Yoko, and the Beatles version of Come and Get It. In fact, there are a number of videos on YouTube showing Billy playing the drums. And as an interesting side note, Billy used the alias of Paul Ramone when he drummed on Steve Miller's song My Dark Hour from 1969. He has also drummed on his own material, a good example being his first solo album, McCartney. Now I know I have focused on Ringo a lot. But the point being made is there is a hidden story which contradicts the official narrative we have been given about the Beatles. Ringo has gone public regarding his battle with booze and drugs. We are told his addiction issues came after the Beatles' breakup, but if we dig deeper, 
we find clues that tell us that some level of substance abuse existed even during his Beatle days. For example, in the sad clown sequence of A Hard Day's Night, Ringo admitted he pulled the scene off even though he was extremely hungover and genuinely miserable that day. The Sun article in the footnote of this slide has a blurb telling us he was not substance-free during the Fab Four's heyday. Ringo tells us he was often drunk in the two decades after the Beatles dissolved. I remember watching Ringo in the movie Let It Be and thinking, he looks hungover. And it's not just Ringo. John Lennon went public with his heroin addiction, which we are told started with the White Album and making its way through the filming of Let It Be. The point is this. When you roll all of this into the equation, the official narrative around the Beatles is extremely suspect. Now let's take a look at another mainstream article that tells us about the Beatles' drug use during the filming of Help. This is an article from The Independent dated February 2020. I would like everyone to keep this article in mind as we head into Part 7 and discuss Rubber Soul because it will tie in. In this article, we are told, The Beatles smoke pot in the plane all the way to the Bahamas. They quote John Lennon who said they were in a haze of marijuana and Lennon saying that during the filming of A Hard Day's Night, he was on pills, adding that the only way to survive in Hamburg, to play eight hours a night, was to take pills. Lennon goes on to say, Help was where we turned on to pot and dropped drink. Simple as that. I've always needed a drug to survive. The others too. But I always had more. More pills. More of everything. Because I'm more crazy, probably. We were smoking marijuana for breakfast during that period. Nobody could communicate with us. It was all glazed eyes and giggling all the time, in our own world. It's like doing nothing most of the time, but still having to rise at 7 a.m., so we became bored. Lennon goes on to say that Dick Lester, the movie's director, knew that very little would get done after lunch. In the afternoon, we very seldom got past the first line of the script. We had such hysterics that no one could do anything. The article then quotes Ringo as saying, if you look at the pictures of us, you can see a lot of red-eyed shots. They were red from the dope we were smoking. And as a side note, shooting ran from 8.30 in the morning to 5.30 at night. I'm not sure a lot of songwriting was getting done during this period. Keep that thought in mind as we move forward with the presentation. Now let's review another cheat sheet article. This one is from February of 2020. In the article, Jeff Emmerich recalled George Harrison walking into the control booth at Abbey Road Studios to demand to get the solo on the Sgt. Pepper track. George got his wish, but not without Emmerich calling the solo embarrassing. The article tells us, George's experimenting with the sitar came at the expense of his guitar playing, and Harrison found himself ceding more solos to his bandmates, usually Paul. The article continues, if you look at examples of Paul taking guitar solos from George in previous years, the recording sessions usually followed a pattern. At first, George would take a crack at the solo. After struggling to get a suitable part down, Paul would step in and knock one out quickly. That's what happened during the revolver sessions of 1966 when George became frustrated trying to record a solo for Taxman, George's own song. After producer George Martin suggested Paul take a whack at it, that was the end of the story. In Here, There, and Everywhere, Emmerich tells us Harrison spent hours trying to nail down the guitar solo, but George spent those hours in vain. When he couldn't come up with something that worked, Paul didn't take long to step into the void. Emmerich recalled, in the end, Paul replaced George's work with a stunning solo of his own, which Harrison was clearly not very happy about. Paul, who once said he directed the Sgt. Pepper sessions, knew exactly what he wanted on the title track. That included taking over rhythm guitar duties from John Lennon. He simply told John, let me do the rhythm on this, I know exactly what I want. John was fine with that. He picked up a bass and did his best to participate on the recording, but that bass part didn't stick. Paul recorded over it with his own bass line. The article continues on by saying, so when Paul said he directed the Sgt. Pepper album, no one has any reason to doubt him. And as a side note, in the memoirs of Billy Shears, Billy explains that he did indeed redo and replace tracks done or assigned to John and George with his own playing. It was Paul who had the idea of making the Sgt. Pepper band uh, a kind of a link, you know, a kind of thing. That was his basic idea. And um, we just went along with that.
Many people believe the Beatles always recorded together, meaning all four participated on every song, but this is not true. For example, the ballad of John and Yoko is Billy and John. Don't Pass Me By, as we discussed, was Billy and Ringo. Biological Paul did not play on She Said, She Said, and George Harrison was the sole Beatle on Within You, Without You. But there are two songs where the Beatles did not record any of the instrumentation. They only recorded the vocals. These two songs are Eleanor Rigby and She's Leaving Home. We are told these songs were written by Paul McCartney and then evolved into the orchestral pieces we know them by through the wizardry of George Martin's arranging. What I have noticed about George Martin when he speaks about Beatles songs is he deploys an interesting technique where he deflects attention away from himself and then redirects the focus back to John and Paul. He especially does this when questions come up about his role in the creation of the Beatles' music. Martin will offer detailed insights into a particular song, sounding very much like the composer of the song, but then passes the baton to Paul and John to weave them into the creative process to ensure songwriting credit. This, in my opinion, is done to shift the focus away from himself as the person most likely responsible for either composing the music or, at the very least, the person coordinating the material coming in for the Beatles to record. When you think about it, how could two guys in their 20s, who could not read or write music, with no musical training, and whose resume consisted of playing cover tunes in clubs and bars, have any semblance of ability to compose these songs? Especially when we are talking about so many songs containing clear evidence of advanced musical composition and ability. In the case of She's Leaving Home, it is very possible Billy composed that song, given the fact that he is a formally trained musician and composer. Add in the expertise of Mike Leander, who arranged the song, and between Billy and Mike, they certainly have the musical ability to bring that song together. However, Eleanor Rigby is a different story, since Biological Paul did not have the skills to compose the song. Even if we give him the benefit of the doubt, by saying perhaps he wrote the song on guitar, Eleanor Rigby is not a guitar song and there is no guitar on the recording. It is an orchestral piece that was composed and arranged by someone with a very deep knowledge of composition, a person such as George Martin. I'm going to play two clips where George is talking about Yesterday and Eleanor Rigby. We already discussed the possibility that Yesterday is a reworking of an old Neapolitan song, but let's listen to George Martin talk about his arrangement of Yesterday. He's very proud of it. And then we will listen to George explain how he went about arranging Eleanor Rigby. And as you listen, think to yourself. Between the Beatles' live gigs, touring, films, public appearances, booze, and drugs, who was really writing and recording these songs? I'm not half the man I used to be. If you look at that yesterday's score, it's pretty naive, but it does work. It's very, very simple writing, but it couldn't be anything else. If it, if it were, it would destroy what the point, point of the song is, which is utter simplicity. I did this in the afternoon. I had it in my mind what I had to do, and um, it was just straightforward. You must have known, given your background and the context that you knew of music, you must have known what an extraordinarily different song it was for yeah. a pop song. Oh, yeah. Terrific. I mean... Uh, wonderful. Uh, but the syncopation in it yes. was marvellous, you know, the... Da, 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 That was Paul's work. All I had to do was just do the strings. But the, you're, you're being very modest because guitar and vocals, that song is a pretty remarkable song. It's unusual modally. It has an English folk song yeah, feel yeah. to it. Its lyrics are unusual. Everything about it is unusual. But the decision to use strings in that particular way and with the rhythmic energy of those strings is what turned it, I think, from a singer-songwriter song into something quite extraordinary. Paul did want to use strings by this time. And when I heard the song, I thought of Bernard Herrmann mm. and all the stuff they did from the Hitchcock films. Yes. And I thought of the strings being very short playing and very spiky and very... Yes. Hitting, hitting yes. like a piano. Yes. And um, 
which would emphasize the, the the syncopated nature yes of the of the song so it's half Paul McCartney, half Bernard Herrmann. <laughs> Neil Squire to George Martin. So they did this audition, recorded audition in effect, in, here in the studio, and you heard it, you liked them, but um, when you heard the music, it, it sounds as if it hadn't really said to you, this is different and this is going to be my big act. You were still probably quite, sounds as if you were quite sceptical. Oh, I had no idea that they were going to be as big as they did become. Um, I thought the sound was good. I thought the sound was intriguing. It was very, quite heavy, heavier than I've been used to. But it was good. But the songs weren't, you see. Mm. The songs, I couldn't see that any of their songs were, were hits. And I knew once I'd signed them, I said, well, I've got to go looking for good songs. Mm. And I did, and I gave them a song which I thought was a hit, which, as you know, was, was How Do You Do It? Mm. And they recorded it. John sang the lead. Didn't want to. Mm. And by this time, and this is when we, we made Le Love Me Do as the first single, and in that audition they'd also played Please Please Me as a very slow Roy Orbison ballad. I said, look, you double the speed, it might stay in a chance, but like that, nothing. As please Please Me did become number one and it became, it became uh, universally accepted and immediately they were in demand and became extraordinarily busy so I didn't get much chance to work with them. Mm. Uh, but I said, go away and write another one that's better than that. You know? mm. And so they accepted the challenge, they grabbed it between their teeth and mm. they came back with From Me To You and then they came back with She Loves You. Mm. And they were good songs, they were terrific songs. And now I've got a specific musical question for you okay. that intrigues me, which is that in several songs, uh, it, particularly the ones by Paul, there is a kind of Lutheran stroke Anglican harmony going on. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples, I think you know what I yeah. mean. Blackbird. They're all over the place. Um, and yesterday, um, these are hymn-like harmonies with hymn-like bass lines, and they crop up all over the place um, for no one. Uh, they're using inversions where the bass isn't the root chord. There are all sorts of things going on. And my question is, where's this coming from? Because it, it, maybe it's to do with your influence and your background and you suggested, look, you could do these bass lines that weren't no. what you'd expect to do. It was them. It really was them. Uh, I can't really claim. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could claim part of the songs. I'd be much richer. What I said to Brown was, if you want me to judge them on what you're playing me, I'm sorry, I have to turn you down. And they had this wonderful charisma. They, they made you feel good to be with them. Mm. And uh, I thought their music was rubbish. <laughs> to wrap up part six, I highly recommend the documentary Hired Gun. The documentary takes you behind the scenes of how the music industry really works by interviewing the A-list musicians responsible for the most famous guitar, drum, and piano solos in the world. It's an eye-opener and a fascinating look into the music business. Let's begin part seven. In June, they made their first world tour, playing Scandinavia, Holland, the Far East, and Australia. Ringo had tonsillitis and missed three quarters of the tour. In his place sat a session drummer, Jimmy Nichol. A 22,000-mile tour of North America followed in August. In only six months, the Beatles had played over 50 cities on four continents. The girls still screamed, but the excitement was gone. Touring had become intolerable. And it became a terrible prison for them because um, all they could do was to go to the concert and then go back to their hotel room and be locked in. 
They had no life at all, they, just the four of them, and no one knows what kind of a life it was except those four themselves. Not even Brian nor I knew really all the problems they had to go through when they were on tour. It's a bit hard when you get up first thing in the morning and you travel all day. You get to a hotel and there's thousands of people outside. You're out in your bedroom. So how they came through, I just don't know. started to hit everybody. I mean, I remember we had one meeting and we were just mainly talking about the musicianship was going downhill, never mind the boredom of doing it. The realization, that, you know, was really kicking in that nobody was listening. And that was okay at the beginning. But even worse than that is we were playing so bad. I mean, I was playing just shit. And you just, you know, I just felt, you know, we're playing really bad. What made us round about uh, 66 uh, question this was that we were becoming really mediocre players, musicians. Okay, now, so see if we can get it simpler and then complicate it where it needs complication. But it's complicated it's so in the bit. Now, but, no, it, I mean, in you know, I mean, now playing with the chord. Yeah. 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 But I always hear myself annoying you. Right, should we try it like this? It's funny that I don't play it when we come to the other I know it's, if this one is like, should we play guitar through attitude? Well, I don't think we should. Okay, well, I don't mind. I'll play, you know, whatever you want me to play. Or I won't play at all if you don't want me to play. No, whatever it is that would please you, I'll do it. The guitar solo in the shell is my composition. I actually uh, wrote, wrote down the notes. I, as I play this, George, you can do, do these notes with me on the guitar. We'll play unison. That kind of thing. You know, we did take certain substances, uh, but never to a great extent at the sessions. At, you know, we took a little, but whenever we'd overdid our intake, the music we made was absolutely shit. And we, you know, we'd go home real happy with the tape and we'd play it when we got home and you'd play it the next day. And it was just every time we'd come back to record again, we'd all look at each other and say, well, we have to do that again. <laughs> because, you know, it, it didn't work. It didn't work for the, for the Beatles uh, to be too deranged when making music. Whoever had composed the song would sing it to me, generally with an acoustic guitar. I would sit myself on a stool in the studio and they would stand in front of me and just sing away. And then we would work out what to do, right? Okay, let's decide how we're going to do the introduction. Shall we have a change of key? What instrument should we bring in? I was always wanting to have new sounds and new ideas coming through. And I found that they were almost more inquisitive than I was. In fact, in the end, it kind of exhausted me. They were saying, what new sounds can we have? What new instruments can we have? What can you do to my voice to make it different? Uh, we're going to make the last verse. OK, just we're before it. Before you made the mistake. All, yeah. Oh, so we're that's, going to do two, in fact. Try thinking more if just for your own sake, but that doesn't have that. We'll no, you, first of all, we'll you it's OK, no, do we, we know. I, I think, think we this know. might be it. <coughs> you just go from chinga, chinga, ching, boom, boom, boom. There. Which bit we going for? Just before be I think all those. Oh, and then you yeah, come you know, and try thinking more if just for your own. I don't know. Yeah, oh, yeah. Just the yeah, last, yeah. Whole last Why not? Here it comes. Here. Sure. He's going to lead us in. Sure enough. It's, I thought, hello. Mm. I'm sorry. Sometimes I feel less than useless at these sessions. I really do. I'm sorry, sometimes I feel less than useless at these sessions. I really do. The clips I just played summarize the key points we need to remember as we now begin part 7 of the presentation, where we analyze the making of Rubber Soul, which I believe is the elephant in the room. A while back, I purchased a DVD titled Deconstructing Rubber Soul, where musicologist Scott Fryman broke down the recording timeline of the album. He tells us Rubber Soul was written rehearsed, and recorded all within 30 days. And going into the sessions, the Beatles had virtually no backlog of songs. They essentially had to write all new material when they walked into the studio. 
As soon as I heard this, I thought, this doesn't seem possible. Write, rehearse, arrange, and record a brand new album consisting of 14 original songs in 30 days? So I decided to take a closer look. In Deconstructing Rubber Soul, Mr. Fryman describes his presentation as the band's day-by-day -day race against the clock. We are told, in October of 1965, the Beatles were faced with an impossible task of producing a new album of original music in time for a Christmas release. Within a month, they had emerged with what many considered to be one of their greatest albums, Rubber Soul. And along with the album, the Beatles also recorded We Can Work It Out and Day Tripper as a double A-side single. Both sides of the single, as well as the album, hit number one on the charts. And now for some background on Scott Fryman. He is a composer and a musician. He is the creator of Deconstructing the Beatles, which is a series of presentations breaking down the recording process behind Beatle albums, such as Rubber Soul, Sgt. Pepper, The White Album, and so on. Mr. Fryman is an internationally recognized expert and lecturer on the music of the Beatles. He is the co-founder and CEO of QWire Incorporated. According to QWire's website, they create collaborative solutions for clearing and licensing music, managing original score and cue sheet reporting for film, television, marketing, and other media. Mr. Fryman has a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science and Music from Yale University and a Master's of Music Composition from New York University. The DVD presentation begins with background information about the Beatles as they made their way into the Rubber Soul recording session. Since I have covered much of the lead-in material already, I will touch on the key points. Mr. Fryman tells us, in the fall of 1965, the Beatles were exhausted. They had just come off a tour and they were tired. The tour was cut short in order to make an album for the Christmas season. The pattern was for the Beatles to release two albums a year in time for Christmas, plus a single and flexi-discs for their fan club. Then we are told, and this is very important, this time the Beatles had not been writing material and they were really empty. And we will dig into this very important piece of information as we progress through this segment. The Beatles entered the studio on October 11th, and as a footnote, some sources state the start date was October 12th. The objective was to have an album in the stores by Christmas, which meant they had to wrap up by November 11th. So the lads had 30 days to write, rehearse, arrange, and record Rubber Soul. It should be noted that the presentation focuses on the British version of Rubber Soul and not the U.S. Capitol release. Mr. Fryman explains that any other group would have written two or three songs and then recorded cover tunes, but not the Beatles, and that Rubber Soul was a big step forward with its lyrics, music, and arrangements, and the music was no longer for dancing, but for listening and thinking, which sounds like a philosophy that would have come from the Theodore Adorno and Willis Harmon schools of thought, just something for us to ponder as we think back to Tavistock. And Mr. Fryman goes on to tell us his presentation will trace the album day by day to show how Rubber Soul came to life. The presentation then takes us through key moments on the Beatles' 1961 through 1965 timeline. We are told that the Beatles with Pete Best were not a great skiffle and garage band. In Germany, they played thousands of hours and became transformed as musicians, performers, and even songwriters. And when I was listening, I thought, it's almost as if the first order of business was for the band to become better musicians and performers versus songwriters. And to illustrate what thousands of hours means, 1,000 divided by an 8-hour workday equals 125 workdays. 2,000 hours is 250 workdays. These numbers again make the point about how much time the Beatles spent doing live performances and tours from 1962 through 1964 as they made their way into 1965 and Rubber Soul. The presentation then tells the audience the Beatles met Brian Epstein in 1961, and in 1962, Ringo joins the band and the Beatles meet George Martin. Mr. Fryman tells us that George Martin is said to have taken this rough group of performers and turned them into people who could perform in a studio. Let that sink in for a moment. George Martin takes this rough group of performers and turned them into people who could perform in a studio. Then George Martin's background as a classically trained musician is discussed, and the audience is told that together, 
meaning George Martin and the Beatles, wrote scores of music. It is explained that George Martin oversaw the sessions, he helped pick tracks, and worked on arrangements, and that Norman Smith was the engineer for the Beatles from 1962 through the end of Rubber Soul. Then we are told the Beatles are selling out and there are amazing crowds everywhere they go, and this is in 1963, and that Beatlemania emerges prior to the release of Please Please Me and with the Beatles, their first two albums, both released in 1963. And then continuing the timeline, in 1964, the Beatles were on The Ed Sullivan Show. Also in 1964, they released A Hard Day's Night, and the Beatles are now touring in stadiums. In 1965, they released their movie Help, despite being in a perpetual fog of marijuana. That's my commentary. And then the song Yesterday is highlighted with its string arrangement by George Martin, and that the Beatles were now on a path to more sophistication. And Mr. Fryman says that a lot of credit needs to go to George Martin. Then we learn Martin left Parlophone EMI over compensation issues and became an independent producer and founded Associated Independent Recording, or AIR. This meant that Martin was now working for the Beatles and not EMI. However, even though Martin was no longer an employee of EMI, he was allowed to use the EMI studios with the Beatles, which seems like an interesting accommodation. And then it's explained that output of other bands put pressure on the Beatles. Some of these other bands at the time were the Rolling Stones, who were a darker alternative to the Beatles, or the Bad Boys of Rock, as we have discussed earlier. The Who were a harder rock band with lyrics teenagers could relate to. We had the Animals and their political messages. The Yardbirds with Eric Clapton. The Birds with David Crosby. And Bob Dylan with Bob's lyrical content. So Mr. Fryman explains that pop songs were becoming lyrically complex, political, and blues-influenced. The Beatles entered into Rubber Soul after coming back from their third American tour, returning on September 2, 1965. And now let's take a look at that tour. Here's the Wikipedia entry for the Beatles' 1965 U.S. tour. This is the tour right before the Rubber Soul recording sessions. The Beatles staged their second concert tour of the United States with one date in Canada in the late summer of 1965. At the peak of the American Beatlemania, they played a mixture of outdoor stadiums and indoor arenas with historic concerts at Shea Stadium in New York and the Hollywood Bowl. Typically of the era, the tour was a package presentation with several artists on the bill. The Beatles played for just 30 minutes at each show following sets by support acts such as Brenda Holloway and the King Curtis Band, Cannibal and the Headhunters, and Sounds Incorporated. After the tour's conclusion, the Beatles took a six-week break before reconvening in mid-October to record the album Rubber Soul. Now, please note that the start date for the tour was August 15th and ended on August 31st. So there were 16 shows in 16 days as the Beatles flew across the U.S., and the narrative makes no mention of any songwriting taking place between September 1st and October 11th when the Beatles entered the studio to record Rubber Soul. Now let's take a look at what Wikipedia has to say. Most of the songs on Rubber Soul were composed soon after the Beatles returned to London following their August 1965 North American tour. The Beatles completed Wait for the Album, having taped the song's rhythm track during the sessions for help in June of 1965. The requirement for a new album in time for Christmas was in keeping with the schedule established in 1963 by Brian Epstein, the group's manager, and George Martin, their record producer. Recording for Rubber Soul began on October 12, 1965 at EMI Studios, now Abbey Road Studios, with final production and mix down taking place on November 15th. The album was one of the first projects that Martin undertook after leaving EMI staff and co-founding Associated Independent Recording, or AIR. The sessions were held over 13 days and totaled 113 hours, with an additional 17 hours spread over six days allowed for mixing. The band was forced to work to a tight deadline to ensure the album was completed in time for a pre-Christmas release. From November 4th, by which point only around half the required number of songs were near completion, the Beatles sessions were typically booked to finish at 3 a.m. each day. As the band's main writers, 
Lennon and Paul McCartney struggled to complete enough songs for the project. After a session on October 27th was canceled due to lack of new material, Martin told a reporter that he and the group hoped to resume next week, but would not consider recording songs by any other composers. Day Tripper and We Can Work It Out were also recorded during the Rubber Soul sessions, but issued separately on a non-album single. For the first time, in order to avoid having to promote the release with numerous television and radio appearances, the Beatles chose to produce film clips for the two songs. The Beatles received their MBEs at Buckingham Palace on October 26th from Queen Elizabeth II. On November 1st through the 2nd, the band filmed their segments for the music of Lennon and McCartney, a Granada television tribute to the Lennon-McCartney songwriting partnership. Final production and mix down took place on November 15th, and Rubber Soul was released three weeks later on December 3rd, 1965. Let's recap what we have learned so far regarding the official narrative. The Beatles return from their U.S. tour. They have a six-week break before recording. There is no backlog of songs coming into the Rubber Soul sessions. For the album, they need 16 songs, 14 for the album itself, two for a single, along with a fan club Christmas flexi-disc. The sessions begin October 11th or 12th, depending on the source. Recording must wrap up by November 11th, 1965, so they have 30 days to nail everything down. The album needs to be released by December 3rd, 1965, in order to get the album into stores by Christmas. The Beatles start midday and stay until after midnight and into the early morning hours. And I should also add that the official story tells us the tape recorder was running continuously to capture takes. So the Beatles started with no songs, and then they were told they had 30 days to crank out 16 original compositions and a flexi-disc. Is this beginning to sound as preposterous to you as it did for me? Let's now take a look at the number of takes per song. Here are the 16 songs from the Rubber Soul recording sessions. The official story, based on mainstream sources, tells us Paul McCartney had some partial elements of Michelle drafted. There was an attempted demo of What Goes On from 1963, but it was not recorded. And we are told the basic tracks for the song Wait were laid down back during the help sessions, and We Can Work It Out was in a partial or draft form. So with the exception of Wait, the pre-existing material for Michelle, What Goes On, and We Can Work It Out was essentially bits and pieces, ideas, fragments, or partial versions of these songs. That still leaves us with 12 songs that did not exist in any shape or form when the lads walked into the studio on October 11th or 12th. Now let's focus on the column of this chart titled Takes. A take refers to the number of attempts to nail down the basic rhythm tracks which typically consists of rhythm guitars, the bass, and the drums, and it could also include the piano. And as you can see, not one song exceeds five takes. In fact, we are told, Think for Yourself, Michelle, What Goes On, and If I Needed Someone was done in one take. Earlier in this presentation, I showed this slide and said, Getting the basic track down may result in several or sometimes dozens of takes to finalize. The number of takes on the songs for Rubber Soul, whether it be one or five, is highly improbable. Remember, the official narrative tells us the Beatles had virtually no material going into Rubber Soul. We are being asked to believe they were composing all of these songs from scratch while in the studio and then nailing down the basic tracks in one to five attempts. When did they practice and rehearse the songs? Some might say, since the tape was continuously rolling, that the practice and rehearsing could have ended up as a take. But I would argue the more likely scenario is the basic tracks, and probably a lot more, like George Martin's arrangements, were already recorded by session musicians, people like Bernard Purdy and others, and the job the Beatles had was to record the vocals and harmonies and get it done in a month. Now let's take a look at some examples of song takes from the 1968 White Album sessions to help put this into perspective. I source these numbers from Mark Lewison's book, The Beatles Recording Sessions. Let's pick some examples of the number of song takes from the 1968 White Album Sessions. Revolution No. 1, the acoustic version, had 22 takes. Blackbird, 32. Sexy Sadie, 117. I Will, 68. 
Happiness is a warm gun, 70. Long, 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 67. Not guilty, 102. Mother Nature's son, 26, and so on. I would argue that what is represented here is a far more realistic view of the number of takes a band might do when recording a song. And it's important to note, the last take may or may not be the best take. An earlier take of a song might be considered better than a later one, and takes can also be combined to create a final version to be used to complete the song with overdubs. But one to five takes, given the 30-day under-the-gun circumstances surrounding Rubber Soul, is incredibly suspect. Now let's take an even closer look at the Rubber Soul timeline. Now let's walk through the Rubber Soul calendar. As we do this, it is very important to remember that the official narrative tells us the Beatles came off their U.S. tour and entered into the Rubber Soul recording sessions with essentially no backlog of songs with the exception of some partial elements of Michelle, a draft version of We Can Work It Out, a previous demo of What Goes On from 1963 which was not recorded, and the Beatles had laid down the basic tracks for the song Wait back during the Help recording sessions. So there are no completed or near completed songs going into Rubber Soul. Even the songs I just mentioned, because they were pieces and parts of songs and not developed, they will require time to pull together in the studio. And, setting these four songs aside, there are still 12 other songs to be recorded which would need to be written from scratch as soon as they walked into the EMI studios on October 11, 1965. Saying this is a daunting task would be an understatement. Some might say it's not even possible. And to recap, Wikipedia tells us, after the tour's conclusion, the Beatles took a six-week break before reconvening in mid-October to record the Rubber Soul album, and then goes on to say, most of the songs on Rubber Soul were composed soon after the Beatles returned to London following their August 1965 North American tour. When Wikipedia states, the songs were composed soon after they returned from their tour, this is ambiguous, and I believe intentionally so, because the official timetable is problematic. Soon after they returned is not specific, and therefore is open to interpretation as to the exact chronology. For example, was it soon after they stepped off the plane? Was it sometime during the break? If so, then the lads weren't on a break. The reality is this. The Beatles' August 1965 U.S. tour had the boys doing 16 shows in 16 days across the United States, including a show in Canada. Also in 1965, leading into Rubber Soul, the Beatles recorded their Help album, they had the filming of the Help movie, and a European tour in June of 1965. And I will show the 1965 schedule with the next slide. As we have already discussed, by using mainstream information, the touring was grueling and exhausting and not conducive to songwriting. So based on the narrative we are given, it is reasonable to assume that when the Beatles got back into London after touring the U.S., they took time to recharge before heading into the studio to record Rubber Soul. In Deconstructing Rubber Soul, Scott Fryman confirms this by explaining, this time the Beatles had not been writing material and they were really empty. And we have clips of Ringo telling us the touring resulted in the Beatles playing really bad and becoming mediocre players and musicians. Now let's look at the 1965 schedule leading into Rubber Soul. Here's a graphical depiction of the Beatles' schedule in 1965. As we have discussed in Part 3, available time is a major obstacle to the official story we are told about the Beatles' songwriting prowess. In January of 1965, the Beatles were finishing up their Christmas shows in London. Then by mid-February, the help recording sessions began which ran through June 18th, and running in parallel from February 23rd through April 14th was the filming of the Help movie. Right after the completion of recording the Help album, the Beatles were off on their European tour, which consisted of 15 shows from June 20th through July 3rd. After a break from the European tour, they were back on the road again, this time touring the U.S. from August 15th through August 31st. After completing the U.S. tour, they had a 39-day break before starting the Rubber Soul sessions, which started on October 11th and finished on November 11th. And then it was back on the road again, finishing up the year with a U.K. tour. 
As we have seen over and over again, their schedule was hectic. So we need to ask again, when did they have time to write all of these incredible songs? Here is the September 1965 calendar. As mentioned, the Beatles returned from their tour on September 2nd, and then they are on a break through October 10th. They will enter the studio on October 11th with the job of composing, rehearsing, arranging, and recording 16 original songs, 14 for the album, 2 for their single, and they are also on the hook to release a flexi-disc for their fan club, all within 30 days and starting with a blank sheet of paper. I would like to point out that rehearsal is very important. It is something that can get lost in this story. Once a song is written, it is always rehearsed in order to get the song down before recording. The process is compose, rehearse, and record. It is not only compose and record. We cannot bypass rehearsal. So the question is not just when did the Beatles have time to write the songs for Rubber Soul, but when did they have time to write and rehearse the songs before recording them? Keep this in mind as we continue on with the presentation. The next few slides will break down what took place during the 30-day period to record Rubber Soul. The song titles with green dots next to them denote the day a song was completed. A red dot indicates a song that was started on that day but did not complete until after that date. For example, Run For Your Life was wrapped up on October 12th, one day after the Beatles walked into the studio. Drive My Car was completed after two days in the studio. Norwegian Wood was started on October 12th, but was not done until October 21st. The orange blocks indicate no recording was done in those days because of mixing or other commitments outside the studio. For example, the Beatles received their MBEs on October 26th, right smack in the middle of recording. For days with no annotation, and I will refer to these days as open days, I assumed these were days where the Beatles were working and rehearsing, but there is no way of really knowing what was going on, so I gave them the benefit of the doubt, meaning on those days, I assume the lads were working on songs. So we can see that from October 12th through October 24th, they completed six of the 16 songs, which were then mixed on October 25th and 26th. This means they wrote, rehearsed, arranged, and finished recording six songs that for all intent and purposes did not exist before October 11th. This is quite a feat. Now let's take a look at November. In November, we can see the time compression or lack of time is very challenging. Because of a TV show commitment, there was no recording on November 1st or 2nd. The Beatles also needed to finish their fan club record, which they did on November 8th, with more mixing taking place on November 9th and 10th. Recording ends on November 11th, but not before the Beatles are said to have completed four songs on the very last day. These songs were You Won't See Me, Girl, Wait, and I'm Looking Through You. Then more mixing takes place on November 15th, and the mono lacquer is cut on November 17th, which leads to Rubber Soul being released in the UK on December 3rd, 1965. I would like to mention that the date of November 11th, 1965, regroups to the Masonic number 33, with November being the 11th month, the day being the 11th, and the last two digits of the year, 65, or 6 plus 5, equaling 11. 3 times 11 equals 33. Before we continue on, I'm going to play samples of four songs which Deconstructing Rubber Soul explains were borrowed by the Beatles when writing Rubber Soul. The songs in question are the Run For Your Life lyric, I'd Rather See You Dead Little Girl Than To Be With Another Man, which was lifted from Arthur Gunter's Baby Let's Play House, Drive My Car's main riff, borrowed from Otis Redding's Respect, If I Needed Someone, borrowed from the Birds, The Bells of Rimney, and You Won't See Me, borrows from the Four Tops, It's the Same Old Song. I will play an excerpt from the borrowed song first, including a karaoke version for Otis Redding's Respect and the Four Tops, It's the Same Old Song. This will help to hear the instrumental without the vocals, and then I will play the Beatles song that borrowed from these songs. For Drive My Car and You Won't See Me, I needed to use a karaoke version of these songs to avoid copyright issues. When comparing Respect with Drive My Car, listen to the main riff and bass line. And for It's the Same Old Song and You Won't See Me, listen to the melody line. 
Here's the bells of Rimney, and you can decide whether you hear if I needed someone. Oh, what will you give me? Say the sad bells of Rimney. Here's the lyric from Baby Let's Play House. Now, Liz, let me tell you, baby, don't you understand? You dead little girl and to be with another man now baby come baby come We'd rather see you dead little girl and to be with another man Here's the main riff from Otis Redding's Respect What you want honey you got it and what you need baby you got it All I'm at And now the karaoke version of Respect. Here's the karaoke version of the Beatles, Drive My Car. And now the four tops, it's the same old song. And now the karaoke version. And now the karaoke version of the Beatles, You Won't See Me. Did you hear any similarities? On December 3rd, 1965, Rubber Soul was released in the UK, a mere 53 days after the Beatles entered the studio on October 11, 1965. Now let's continue on with our inspection of the Rubber Soul timeline. This slide compares October and November side by side. I color-coded the events and activities to make it easier to see what took place on a particular day. Yellow represents turnkey events. For example, the start of recording, the end of recording, the lacquer being cut, and the release of the album. Red shows us songs that were started on a particular day and then finished at a later date. The color green denotes the recording of the song was completed. Orange indicates days where other activities such as mixing and commitments outside of the studio took place. For example, the Beatles receiving their MBEs on October 26th, and light blue are days where I could not find any specific activity and assume the lads were in the studio working. The first thing I noticed was on October 12th, one day after arriving in the studio, the Beatles completed Run For Your Life. Two days in, we are told they nailed Drive My Car. After five days, Day Tripper was in the bag. Remember, none of these songs were written or existed prior to October 11th. How can this be? Songs denoted with a star represent songs where recording started and completed on the very same day. This would include Run For Your Life, Drive My Car, Day Tripper, Michelle, What Goes On, Think For Yourself, The Word, You Won't See Me, and Girl, or nine of the 16 songs, which is mind-boggling, if what we are told is true. Even though the boys were under the gun writing, rehearsing, and recording, they still had time to work on their fan club deliverable, receive their MBEs, and take two days to record a TV show. When we break it down by month, 
they completed eight songs within 21 days in October, and in November, they finished the remaining eight songs in 11 days, or 16 songs over a span of a month. It's quite a feat. Now let's focus on the bottom right of the slide and the arrow. From October 11th, when recording started for Rubber Soul, to the day the album was released on December 3rd, spanned 53 days. This schedule is so compressed that it defies believability. But the calendar becomes even more suspicious when we calculate the 22 days from when recording ended, which was on November 11th, to the release date of December 3rd, and then further compounded by the mere 16 days between the cutting of the lacquer on November 17th and release on December 3rd. The time between these events is not enough runway to get the album out when we factor in key activities such as stampers, labels, pressing, sleeve design, printing, and distribution. So what's going on? I will explore this question in more detail in just a moment. Now let's move to the next slide. With this slide, I wanted to boil down and summarize the details we just walked through. When we look at the 30 days for the Beatles to write, rehearse, record, and arrange 16 original compositions for Rubber Soul, it breaks out this way. Of the 30 days, 10 would have been available for writing and rehearsal, 15 were spent recording songs, and 5 days went to activities outside the studio. Now, even if someone wanted to argue that writing and rehearsal or rehearsal and recording were done concurrently, which is an enormous stretch, the sheer number of songs being created from scratch and then recorded within a 30-day window is unrealistic. In other words, the official story does not work. Something else is at play. Before we continue, let me play the Think For Yourself audio clip from the Revolver Sessions. This will be an abbreviated version since the original clip is almost 20 minutes in length. I will include a link to the original video in the description box below. As you listen, take in the overall dynamic of how this is going in the studio. And this is recording the vocals for just one song. The first thing I thought was, this is moving very slowly. We have the lads trying to get the vocals down interspersed with their joking around. In fact, at the end of this clip, John Lennon says sometimes he feels less than useless at these sessions. And if they struggled like this with the vocals for Think For Yourself, which by the way, had the working title Won't Be There With You, and we will talk more about this later, how in the world did they record 16 songs in 30 days? But these are just my thoughts. I'll play the clip and let you decide. And go where you're going oh, yeah. to the first take, you know. Now I've got it in my bleeding mind for remembering it. I will have a cup. About the good things that we can have if we now play major. Can have they allow me play. About the good things that we can have if we close our eyes. Close our eyes. Close our eyes, 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 I'll play this. Otherwise, you. About the good things that we can have if we close our eyes. Close our eyes. I keep going. Oh, it doesn't matter what I keep going. No. I've forgotten what I keep If we close our eyes. About the good things we can have if we close our eyes. Okay. Ready, Ed and Matt. To say about the girls that you do. Bear with me or have me shot. Oh, uh, we'll just have to have a go of it, you see. Yes, I know exactly what you mean. Hmm. It could be there and it couldn't. Could be where? There. Or it couldn't. All right, Paul, come along now. We close up. Well, the good okay. things that we could have. We close. Alright. If we close our eyes, close our eyes, it just. If we close our eyes. 
sure that wasn't the real one, but that will do. If that works, I'm in for it. It wasn't one, no. Well, all right. It'll do. It's an answer. Two same wheel, two same runs. Where are you going to? Close our eyes. We're on. Where are you going to? Close our eyes. Okay, I think I might have it now. Where are you going to? Oh, you're right, pickle. I know. I get something in my head, you know, and all the walls of Rome couldn't stop me. Is that right, pickled onion? Pooh, and I stink too. I'm waiting for somebody to say something about it. It's that anti-odorant you use. Da 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 Keep quiet. Oh, well, let's try another one. I did want to do variations on the theme. Because he would kept pointing up there. Why did you keep pointing up there every time? I was doing it as a joke because every time we came to there, you pointed it out. Well, you know, that was the first time that I went wrong when you started doing that. And ever since then, we've had this trouble. Do you want to fight? No. Okay. Good. <laughs> Let's settle it. <laughs> Otherwise. <laughs> you play snooker? Yeah. I don't. Sure. Play you see Rocky Marciano <laughs> <laughs> last yeah. night? Yeah. Mm. Mm. All the conversations about everything else, and he goes, I remember the great Joe Lewis. He was a great fighter. Double dabba, double dabba, double dabba. <laughs> right. Somebody up there likes me. Who is this? Okay. It's Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. It's who you Who gave twice. his only begotten bread. For us to live and die on. <laughs> and that's why we're all here. And I'll tell you, brethren, <laughs> yeah. there's more of them than there are of us. And that's why there's so few of us left. Why such fury? <laughs> Condemn thou the thoughts of man. Yeah, what is right. this wrath that behold you? Why such favour? Why such favour? Okay, let's go. And he called and they bloody well come. Oh, aye. Yes, but oh, if you look in your Bible, I can't go on, I really can't. Come on, let's do this bleeding record. George, can we take it? You know that. Mine? No, you want to go down here, boss. Hey, you can't do it in bits, can you? Well, let's. Oh, we'll have one more try, you know, and then if not, you know, I, I can see. Troy. It looks like supercars getting out of control, Troy. This is the show. How come you fuck up everything that you do? <laughs> I will be pleased to see the Earth men disintegrated. Okay. <laughs> Go from you just all of your, you know, the beginning of the last verse. What did you do then, Paul? Very interesting. Although you're not upset, I can't explain the things. And you've got to you got to To up to worry, woo. Right, we're going to miss the last verse. Okay, just before it. Yeah. Oh, so we're going to do two, in fact. Let's try thinking more if just for your own sake, but that doesn't have that. We'll it's okay, no, we, we, we know. I, I mean, think we know. Might be it. <coughs> you just go from chinga, chinga, ching, boom, boom, boom. The. Which bit we go for? Just before I think all those. And then you can try thinking more if just for your own sake. I don't know. Oh, just the last whole last verse. Why not? Here it comes. Sure. He's got to lead us in. Sure enough. It's I thought, hello. Mm. I'm sorry, sometimes I feel less than useless at these sessions. I really do. Mm. Of course, Cynthia understands. I often talk to her about it when we get home. Here's an excerpt from Wikipedia regarding Think for Yourself. We can see the spirit of William Mann lives on. From the section titled Musical Form, we are told the song's musical key is a combination of G major and G minor. Musicologist Alan Pollock comments that whereas Lennon and Paul McCartney had regularly employed a major key, 
and its parallel minor to provide an element of contrast in their songs, Harrison's composition ensures that the two modes are blended, creating a form that is neither quite really major nor minor. Dominic Pedler, another musicologist, tells us while G major appears to be the central key, the song's musical premise involves permanent tonic key ambiguity and restless root movement through extensive borrowing from the parallel minor key. Wikipedia continues, The unusual chord progression is an example of the Beatles' use of chords for added harmonic expression, a device that Harrison adopted from Lennon's approach to melody. Musicologist Walter Everett describes the composition as a tour de force of altered scale degrees. He adds that, Such is the ambiguity throughout, its tonal quality forms the perfect conspirator with the texts and rhythms hesitations in unexpected turns. Pollock also views the composition as musically adventurous. He identifies it as a curious stylistic hybrid in the pop rock genre, comprising blues-inflected motifs within a folk-based framework. Here again, we see published information that is intended to paint the Beatles as brilliant songwriters, and in this case, George Harrison. The same Beatles and George Harrison, who in the previous video clip, struggled with the vocal track for Think For Yourself. This extolling is no different than William Mann's declaration of the Beatles' use of aeolian cadences and pandiatonic clusters. It's the same script. But thankfully, we have John Lennon to ground us when he told us, to this day, I don't have any idea what aeolian cadences are, and then adding, none of us are technical musicians, none of us could read music, none of us can write it. George. Uh, now that you've learned to play the sitar, do you expect to play any more instruments? I haven't learned to play the sitar. I mean, Ravi Shankar hasn't learned to play it. He's been playing it 35 years. Now we're going to examine the turnaround or cycle time to get Rubber Soul released and in stores by December 3rd in time for Christmas sales. As I mentioned, the 30 days to record Rubber Soul is suspect in itself, but the time between November 11th, when recording ended, to the album being distributed and stocked in retail stores by December 3rd is even more suspicious. To get a baseline, let's take a look at the calendar once again. As we know, recording ends on November 11th. Then six days later, the mono lacquer is cut. The lacquer is also referred to as the acetate. The lacquer is required in order to begin the process of pressing vinyl records. So on December 3rd, 22 days after recording ends on November 11th and 16 days after the lacquer is cut on November 17th, Rubber Soul is in stores in time for Christmas purchasing. Now all this might not seem like a big deal, but the problem is the process of manufacturing the records not only includes the creation of the lacquer, but also the creation of stampers, manufacturing the record labels, pressing the records, creating the sleeves, packaging the records, and of course, distribution. One of our team members that I worked with has been in the music business for decades and is very familiar with the record pressing process and its associated cycle time. When I reviewed the Rubber Soul timeline with them, they told me the timeline of two weeks is not possible. I asked them why, and they said the cycle time to release a record from the time the lacquer has been approved and cut is six weeks at a minimum with eight weeks being the norm. So the clock to release a record starts when the lacquer is cut. Prior to the lacquer being created, all the recording and mixing obviously needs to be completed, along with the sequencing, which is the process of ordering the songs on an album. Sequencing includes defining the silence between songs, crafting fade-ins and fade-outs between tracks, and choosing the order of music on a release. Once all this is done, the result would make its way onto quarter-inch tape from which a lacquer and test pressing can be produced. And as I mentioned, once the lacquer is cut, it then takes six to eight weeks to release an album and into stores. So in the case of Rubber Soul, the clock to release the album started on November 17th when the lacquer was cut, and not November 11th when recording ended. When we calculate the six-week minimum for Rubber Soul using November 17th as our start date, this puts Rubber Soul in stores no earlier than December 29th, and even this date is aggressive because of logistics around the Christmas holiday, but we will use December 29th as our stake in the ground. So if Rubber Soul were expedited through EMI's process, 
The turnaround to release the record should have been a minimum of six weeks or 42 days and not the 16 days or two weeks we are told. Our team member explained, even if EMI dedicated 100% of its capacity to rubber sole, the 16 days is still not possible. For one, it would have meant all other artists on the EMI roster with Christmas release dates would have had their releases delayed, jeopardizing EMI's forecast for the Christmas sales period, and more importantly, the process itself, whether at full capacity for the Beatles or not, simply could not support 16 days to push Rubber Soul through the pipeline. However, we know Rubber Soul was released on December 3rd, so what's going on? The only way 16 days can work is if part of the process was already underway, either before or during the time the Beatles were in the studio, and we will explore this premise in a moment. But before we do that, let's understand a bit more about the process behind releasing a record. After recording ends, but before the lacquer is created, the songs are mixed, mastered, and sequenced. Once an initial lacquer is cut, it needs to be approved, and then a test pressing is created. This is done to ensure there are no issues with the pressing. Once the lacquer is approved, stampers are created, which are used to press the vinyl records. In parallel with this process is the creation of record labels that will be adhered to the center of the vinyl records, which contains the songs on the album. The album art for the record sleeves is also underway. Since the record labels and album sleeves both contain the titles of the songs, it cannot be created until all the songs are known. Let's keep this in mind as we move forward. The printing process for album sleeves is referred to as four-color printing, or CMYK printing. The four-color process is the most widely used method for printing full-color images. These four colors are cyan, magenta, yellow, and black which are known collectively as C, M, Y, and K. The printing process was all ink-based, and anything printed needed time to dry before proceeding with adhering album art to the cardboard sleeves. Once the record sleeves are finalized, the records are inserted into the sleeves and then packed and distributed to record stores and retail outlets. It should be noted that back in the day, retail was a decentralized model, meaning the records needed to make their way to the many brick-and-mortar stores selling records throughout the UK. Now that we have an understanding of the process to release a record, let's circle back to further examine how Rubber Soul could have been released on December 3rd, knowing a minimum of six weeks is required from the time the lacquer is cut to when the album hit the stores on December 3rd. Here again is the 1965 timeline from earlier in the presentation. In January, the Beatles began the year by finishing up their 1964 Christmas shows, and then by mid-February, they were recording both their Help album and movie, which overlapped. The album wraps up on June 18th, and then on June 20th, the lads begin their European tour, which concludes on July 3rd. They have a break for approximately six weeks, and on August 15th, they begin their U.S. tour with the last show on August 31st. They then have another six-week break before heading into the studio to record 16 new original compositions, 14 for Rubber Soul and two for their single. And remember, they have virtually no backlog of material going into the sessions. They are in the studio for 30 days to write, rehearse, and record Rubber Soul, and then three weeks after departing EMI Studios, they begin their UK tour on December 3rd, the same day Rubber Soul is released in the United Kingdom. As we can see, the Beatles had a very busy schedule, starting in January and right up through October 11th when they came into the studio to record. So again, the lack of time is a constant major factor when trying to reconcile when John Lennon and Paul McCartney had time to collaborate, compose, and rehearse new material. Before we continue on, let's summarize what we have learned about the lads from mainstream sources regarding their skills as musicians and songwriters. The Beatles were a cover band playing bars and clubs from their early days up through 1962 when they met George Martin. We learned their live performances and touring was constant and exhausting, and these performances, along with everything else they were obligated to, left little to no time to compose music. When George Martin met the lads, he was not impressed and said they had nothing behind them and he thought their music was rubbish. 
Then we have the Mercy Beat article from 1962, which I consider a smoking gun, telling us they were headed off to EMI and would be recording songs specifically written for the group given to them by George Martin. We know that George Martin hired Andy White to drum on Love Me Do and P.S. I Love You, and Bernard Purdy tells us he drummed on 21 Beatles songs covering the early albums. We have mainstream articles telling us the Beatles borrowed from other songs, including the possibility of Yesterday and Hey Jude lifting content from Italian Neapolitan songs. We have Billy, a.k.a. Paul McCartney, claiming he wrote the music to In My Life, as well as articles telling us Sgt. Pepper was Billy's concept and he directed the Pepper sessions, which included playing guitar parts slotted for John and George. Quincy Jones tells us the Beatles couldn't play, saying they were no playing motherfuckers. Ringo told us that because of all the touring, the musicianship of the band declined and they were playing badly. And as we know, the Beatles were always on the road before heading into the recording studio. In the 1980 Playboy interview, John tells us the Beatles were not technical musicians and could not read or write music. And in another interview, he stated he was embarrassed by his guitar playing and that George's playing was just okay. We learned that George's guitar skills suffered as he focused on the sitar, and this was part of the reason why he relinquished guitar solos. And then we have John and Ringo telling us they were in a haze of marijuana during the filming of Help. When we put all of this together, none of this paints a picture of a brilliant band capable of brilliant songwriting. We are asked to believe the Beatles went from songs like this To songs like these in three years. From Bar Band to Rubber Soul in Three Years. I'll let you decide. Another very telling clue that the Beatles did not write their own music is George Martin's reaction to fellow composer Howard Goodall's question about who was responsible for the advanced musical construct of Beatles songs as he uses Blackbird, Yesterday, and For No One as examples. When George Martin is asked a question, he puts his index finger to his lips, flashing up the Masonic tell no secrets symbolism. With this simple gesture, George Martin is telling his Freemasonic Brotherhood, and possibly Mr. Goodall himself, if he is a Mason, we are not going there. George Martin then denies anyone other than the lads were involved in the composing of these songs, which is the redirect he does so often in interviews. This is a very important clip because, by doing what he did, George Martin is telling us the Beatles did not write these compositions. Let's run that clip again and take a look. Now, I've got a specific musical question for you okay. that intrigues me, which is that in several songs, uh, particularly the ones by Paul, there is a kind of Lutheran stroke Anglican harmony going on. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. I think you know what I yeah. mean. Blackbird. Uh, uh, they're all over the place. Um... And yesterday, um, these are hymn-like harmonies with hymn-like bass lines, and they crop up all over the place um, for no one. Uh, they're using inversions where the bass isn't the root chord. There are all sorts of things going on. And my question is, where's this coming from? Because it, it, maybe it's to do with your influence and your background, and you suggested, look, you could do these bass lines that weren't no. what you'd expect to do. It was them. It really was them. Uh, I can't really claim. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could claim part of the songs. I'm, 
be much richer. The guitar solo in the shell is my composition. I actually uh, wrote, wrote down the notes. As I play this, George, you can do it. Do these notes with me on the guitar. We'll play unison. That kind of thing. Let's now discuss the mystery behind when the Rubber Soul photo shoot took place. So what was the exact date of the photo shoot for the album cover? Many people assume it was right after the Beatles finished up recording on November 11th. However, I could not find a definitive date as to when the photo shoot took place. We know Robert Freeman was the photographer, and according to mainstream accounts, the shoot took place at Lennon's property in Weybridge. Date speculation ranges from during the filming of Help, which was in the spring of 1965, to right after the Beatles finished recording in mid-November, and of course, there are all the dates in between. Doing the photo shoot after recording Rubber Soul seems highly unlikely, given the time constraints to get the album released by December 3rd. Back in 1965, Paul McCartney allegedly said, When we came to choose which of Bob's photos we should use for the cover of Rubber Soul, he visited us at a friend's flat one evening. While projecting the slides onto an album-sized piece of white cardboard, Bob inadvertently tilted the card backwards. The effect was to stretch the perspective and elongate the faces. We excitedly asked him if it was possible to print the photo this way. Being Bob, he said, yes, and the cover to our album Rubber Soul was decided. This blurb, aside from sounding completely contrived, also sounds as if the lads were relaxing at a friend's flat. Since we are told the Rubber Soul sessions started by midday and running through midnight and into the wee hours of the morning, we can logically assume this moment of relaxing at a friend's flat did not take place between October 11th and November 11th. So it had to be before October 11th, and if I had to guess, it was either during the six-week break after the European tour or the U.S. break right before the Rubber Soul sessions. My guess is it took place in July of 1965 when they were on a break from their European gig. I feel confident it did not take place during the recording of Rubber Soul or afterward because time was of the essence to get the record out. But why is the date for the photo shoot a mystery? I believe it's because if the date is known, then it would be easier for researchers like myself to start examining the timeline and then conclude Rubber Soul was in the works way before the Beatles arrived in the studio on October 11th. And this will make more sense as we continue on. As I covered earlier in the presentation, the official narrative tells us three songs, and perhaps a fourth, depending on the source, were completed on the very last day of recording, which was November 11th. These songs are The Word, You Won't See Me, Girl, and the fourth being I'm Looking Through You. We are also told Think For Yourself had a working title of Won't Be There With You. These two situations, as told to us, present a problem. With three to four songs not completed until the last day of recording, and one song having a working title for an unknown period, would have introduced more compression into an already daunting timeline since George Martin could not mix these songs until they were completed or start the process of calculating the run times and sequencing which is required to create the record, the record labels, and the album sleeves. Since the official story and timeline does not stack up, let's try to figure out what was really going on and how did Rubber Soul get released 16 days after the lacquer was cut. Here's the calendar once again. This time, I will step through it to set the table for when certain aspects of the process of releasing Rubber Soul should have logically happened. Before we start, remember, the Beatles had no backlog of material going into Rubber Soul. The lads had 30 days to write, rehearse, arrange, and record 16 new original songs from October 11th through November 11th. And Rubber Soul is then released on December 3rd, a mere 16 days after the mono lacquer is cut on November 17th. On the chart, you will see the yellow balls numbered 1 through 6. Number 1 reminds us of the Beatles' activities leading up to Rubber Soul. This includes finishing their Christmas shows from 1964, making their Help album, their Help movie, and touring Europe and the U.S. Number two represents the 30 days the boys spent in the studio to record Rubber Soul, which again is October 11th through November 11th. Ball number three points to November 17th, 
the day the lacquer was cut. This is the day we start with when calculating the cycle time to get the album released on December 3rd, which the official story tells us was 16 days. Number four is the minimum amount of time in real-world cycle time to release a record. This amount of time, as we have covered, is six weeks or 42 days. Number five points to December 29th, the day Rubber Soul should have been released, when we start with November 17th, the day the lacquer was cut, and then counting six weeks or 42 days forward. But since we know Rubber Soul was in stores on December 3rd, and six weeks is the minimum cycle time to get a record released when we factor in pressing, sequencing, artwork, sleeves, etc., then by starting with December 3rd and counting back six weeks, we will identify a date which is more indicative of when the process should have started in order to release Rubber Soul on December 3rd, and that date is represented by number six on the slide, which is October 22nd. So from October 22nd to December 3rd is the six-week or 42-day minimum required to release the album. Since I concluded, it was not possible for the Beatles to have written, rehearsed, arranged, and recorded 16 songs in 30 days, and then have the record out 16 days after the lacquer was cut, then logic tells me other key components of the process must have been either already underway or completed by the time the Beatles showed up in the studio on October 11th. So what were those components? Let's move to the next slide and I will walk you through my theory. Here is what I believe took place behind the scenes to get Rubber Soul released by December 3rd, 1965. Above the dotted line are those activities which took place before October 11th, with the exception of row 4, which would be no later than October 22nd. The rows below the dotted line, or rows 5 through 10, are those activities that took place from October 11th through December 3rd. Again, it's important to keep in mind that leading into Rubber Soul, the Beatles were performing gigs, touring, filming, and in the studio to make the Help album. So as the Beatles were out and about, this is what I believe was going on in parallel. Starting with row one. All of the songs for Rubber Soul were written and arranged beforehand by professional songwriters, not the Beatles. Row two. With the songs written, the instrumental tracks for the album were then recorded by session musicians and produced by George Martin. The vocals and harmonies for the songs would be recorded between October 11th and November 11th by the Beatles. Once the instrumental tracks of the songs were recorded, including any orchestration, the songs were mixed down awaiting the vocals. Row 3. With the instrumental tracks of the songs recorded and mixed down, with the exception of the vocals, George Martin can now calculate the run times and do the sequencing which is required to start the process of printing the labels and sleeves, which he does. Row 4. The album art, sleeves, and labels are then sent off for printing. Once the printing is completed, all that is left to do is to have the records pressed and then inserted into the record sleeves and prepped for distribution. All of this, up to this point, is done before the Beatles stepped into the studio. Row 5. From October 11th through November 11th, the Beatles are in the studio to learn the vocal melodies and then record the vocals and harmonies. They do not play the instruments on Rubber Soul. Their role is to sing the songs. Row 6. Once the vocals are done, George Martin creates the final mix of each song by mixing the Beatles' vocal tracks down with the music previously recorded by the session musicians. He does this on October 25th, 26th, and November 15th. Row 7. The final tape of Rubber Soul is completed and is sent off to have the lacquer cut by November 17th. Soon after the lacquer is finalized, the stampers are created to press the records. Row 8. Starting on or about November 18th, the initial pressings of Rubber Soul begin and the process of manufacturing, packaging, and staging is underway. The records are then sent to EMI distribution. Row 9. Between December 1st and December 3rd, stores take delivery of the first batch or initial copies of the album. Row 10. 
Pressings and deliveries continue after December 3rd as part of the normal production and distribution process. So the 16 days from when the lacquer was cut on November 17th to rubber sole being in stores on December 3rd was focused on expediting the manufacturing of the first batch of albums or initial pressings. Everything else in the process, such as the labels, sleeves, etc., were already in the bag and in a holding pattern waiting for the records to be pressed so they can be packaged and sent out to stores. And yes, I have concluded the Beatles did not play on Rubber Soul. Their part in the making of the album was to do the singing. The creation of Rubber Soul was done in stages. Otherwise, there was no way to get the album out by December 3rd. I also believe this was the model for the Beatles' first seven albums, from Please Please Me through Revolver, and I will discuss this in more detail in a moment. Now let's move to the next slide for a more graphical depiction of this timeline. This slide is color-coded. Blue represents the timeline from January 1st through October 10th, the day before the Beatles entered the studio. Yellow denotes October 11th through November 11th, when the Beatles were in the studio recording the vocals. Green is when the final mix was completed for all of the songs, marrying the vocals with the music. Red reflects the cutting of the lacquer, the pressing of the records, and preparing the records for distribution and delivery. Starting with ball number one, during the time period leading up to October 11th, the Beatles are performing, touring, filming help, and attending the help recording sessions. Running concurrently with their schedule, we have professional songwriters writing all the songs for Rubber Soul, with most, if not all, of the arrangements being done by George Martin. And because the songs are already written, the song titles are known. Then all the Rubber Soul instrumental tracks are recorded by session musicians, with George Martin producing. With the music tracks recorded, the run times and sequencing can now be completed. Then the recorded tracks are mixed down in preparation for the vocals. Now the album art, sleeves, and labels can be sent out for printing and set aside waiting on the completion of the vinyl records. And then from October 11th through November 11th, the Beatles are in the studio to record the vocal tracks. Then George Martin finalizes the mix to merge the music with the vocals with the last mix taking place on November 15th. Martin then sends the final tape off to have the lacquer cut, which happens on November 17th, which leads to the stampers and records being pressed, packaged, and expedited in order to make the December 3rd deadline. As I mentioned in the previous slide, I believe Rubber Soul was created in stages, otherwise the date of December 3rd could not have been met. I also believe this was the model used for all of the Beatle albums up through and including Revolver. What we have from 1962 through 1966 is four guys in their 20s who could grind it out and be the veneer for music that was not written by them, but by uncredited professional songwriters and composers who were working behind the scenes on behalf of Tavistock to use the Beatles as a tool for social engineering. The Beatles were not groomed to be songwriters, because Tavistock already had their songwriters. The Beatles were trained to be actors, performing in front of the curtain on the world stage, who would play music and recite scripts given to them by the people operating behind the scenes. The reason for the relentless performing in the early 1960s, up through their meeting George Martin in 1962, was to develop their performance skills so they were ready to hit the road running when Tavistock threw the switch to bring Beatlemania and the ensuing social change into the mass consciousness. During those early years, the Beatles were a cover band playing bars and clubs, and ironically, that's exactly what they continued to be at least through the 1962 through 1966 period. In the 1980 Playboy interview, John Lennon tells us, I had become a craftsman, and I could have continued being a craftsman. I respect craftsmen, but I am not interested in becoming one. And then adding, when the Beatles played in America for the first time, they played pure craftsmanship, meaning they were already old hands. In Freemasonry, a mason is referred to as a craftsman. And when we look up the definition of craftsman in the dictionary, it says, a person who is skilled in a particular craft. Was John dropping clues? Was he telling us that he and the Beatles were Freemasons working on behalf of the social engineers of Tavistock? As well as telling us 
that the Beatles were very skilled at doing what they did best, which was to make the illusion appear real. In the 1971 Rolling Stone interview, John mentions the myth of the Beatles a number of times. He tells us, I no longer believe in myth. The Beatles is another myth. And then later on in the interview, when asked about Dylan's music, he says, the rest of it is just like Lennon McCartney or something. It's no different. It's a myth. And when asked about the Beatles growing apart, John said, they remembered that they were four individuals. You see, we believe the Beatles myth too. I don't know whether the others still believe it. Now let's move to part eight and take a brief look at the White Album narrative. While in India, John and Paul had accumulated a backlog of more than 30 new songs. George and Ringo too had been busy composing. There was enough material, in fact, to make the next album a two-record set, which they planned to call simply The Beatles. An ironic title, considering it was the least group-like effort to date. As I mentioned when I started this presentation, I focused on the 1962 through 1966 time frame because it is the foundation of the Beatles. It is this period that brought the band into prominence and set the stage for Phase 2 of the Beatles, which kicked off with the release of Sgt. Pepper in 1967. After analyzing 1962 through 1966, I wanted to take a look into one of the band's later albums to see if there were any interesting anomalies, and I decided to look at the White Album. As the previous video stated, the mainstream narrative tells us the Beatles and primarily John and Paul had accumulated a backlog of over 30 songs while in India. This level of prolific creativeness intrigued me. Was it possible? So I decided to take a look. The White Album was the Beatles' ninth studio album, and here again, the number nine shows up. The album also contains the track Revolution Number no. 9, with its famous Turn Me On Dead Man phrase when playing the track backwards. The number nine reference even made its way into the Beatles' solo work with John Lennon's number no. 9 Dream from his 1974 Walls and Bridges album, and of course, George Harrison's album, Cloud Nine. Aside from the number no. 9 representing biological Paul McCartney within the Beatles' occult symbolism, it also represents transformation, as in social transformation or social engineering. The White Album was recorded between May 30th and October 17th and released on November 22nd. When we add the month and day together of November 22nd, we get 11 plus 22, summing to 33, which is another very prominent number within the occult circles. The number of elapsed days between the start of recording and the end of recording is 141 days. When we add 1 plus 4 plus 1, the number reduces to 6, another occulted number which is commonly found around the Beatles. The number of days between the end of recording on October 17th to the album's release on November 22nd is 36 days. 3 plus 6 equals 9. Once again, the cycle time between when recording completed to release of the album appears suspect. If we assume there was a week between the end of recording to when the lacquer was cut, that would mean the lacquer was ready on October 24th leaving 29 days to get the record into stores. And as we know, six weeks or 42 days is the minimum cycle time for the release process. Wikipedia tells us most of the songs on the White Album were written during March and April of 1968 while the Beatles were in India, and that the White Album scaled back on the sound and studio innovation when compared to the Beatles' previous albums, especially Sgt. Pepper. Wikipedia also goes on to say that George Martin did not attend the entirety of the sessions. We are told he abruptly picked up and left to go on holiday and handed the production over to Chris Thomas. The reasons for Martin leaving vary depending on sources, but range from Billy taking control of the sessions to the sessions not being up to George Martin's standards, or perhaps it was a combination of both. With the release of the 50th anniversary edition of the White Album, some may have become familiar with the Escher demos. Here is a Rolling Stone article about the tapes. Escher is the location of George Harrison's psychedelic painted bungalow where we are told the Beatles hunkered down with acoustic guitars, 
light percussive instruments, and a four-track tape machine, which they let roll and ended up recording 27 acoustic demos. The Beatles' Bible states the precise date of the recording of the Escher material is unknown. As with the Rubber Soul photo shoot, we have yet another elusive date regarding a key moment along the Beatle timeline. The article reiterates the story that the songs were penned primarily during their time in India, and then goes on to say something very interesting. Quote, Considering their blitzkrieg of activity since returning to the West six weeks earlier, meaning from India, it's surprising the group managed to find even a single day to work on music. Any trace of inner serenity cultivated in India had been obliterated as they busied themselves with the launch of their multimedia company, Apple. End quote. Let's read that again. It's surprising the group managed to find even a single day to work on new music. Of the 27 songs known to exist from that day, 19 would wind up on the White Album, 2 would be held over for Abbey Road, and 6 were never issued by the group as an active unit. We are told that John Lennon contributed a whopping 15 compositions to the proceedings, Billy, a.k.a. McCartney, 7, and Harrison, 5. So the Beatles went to George Harrison's bungalow on an unknown day in May of 1968, right before starting the recording of the White Album on May 30th, and cranked out 27 songs for the demo. I will suggest this story defies believability. From Wikipedia, we are told, quote, Instead of tightly rehearsing a backing track, as had happened in previous sessions, the group would simply record all the rehearsals and jamming, then add overdubs to the best take, end quote. This is a curious statement because... We now know from analyzing Rubber Soul that there was no rehearsal prior to recording that album. And this is because there were no songs to rehearse until the Beatles allegedly wrote 16 songs upon entering the studio back in 1965. The writing and rehearsing as the tape rolled in hopes of catching the right moment is the same story we are told about Rubber Soul. The premise being George Martin, or in the case of the White Album, Chris Thomas, would then use the best takes to splice and edit to create a song. This is an unlikely approach to recording, since it could result in an undisciplined and unreliable schedule. And my bet is, the White Album was absolutely slotted to release on November 22nd, as the date is highly occulted. For example, it is also the same day of JFK's assassination and the release of the band's second album with the Beatles, both of which took place on November 22nd 1963. Coincidence? I'll let you decide. Wikipedia then goes on to tell us that only 16 of the album's 30 tracks had all four band members performing, meaning the rest of the tracks, or almost half the album, did not feature the full group. I should also mention that in the memoirs of Billy Shears, Billy tells us he intended to have 33 songs on the White Album, but because of lack of material and time, he had to settle for 30. But that was later addressed when Apple released The Past Masters, which contained 33 songs. So let's quickly recap. We are told the Beatles wrote over 30 songs while in India. Then after they returned, they recorded 27 songs for a demo on an unknown day in May of 1968. Then they started recording the White Album on May 30th, with the approach of letting the tape roll to capture their playing and rehearsing in hopes of pulling together enough viable material to release an album. Let's move to the next slide. Let's swing back to India for a moment, because this is where we are told the Beatles had their prolific burst of creativity and wrote over 30 songs, two-thirds of which ended up on the White Album. Again, from Wikipedia, we are told the lads arrived in India in mid-February 1968 with their wives, girlfriends, assistants, and reporters. The article goes on to say the lads had varying degrees of commitment toward the meditation and the retreat. Then we are told Ringo left on March 1st after 10 days. Billy, a.k.a. Paul, left later in March to attend to business concerns, and George and John departed on April 12th after finding out the Maharishi had lusty thoughts. So the Beatles arrive in mid-February, with Ringo and Billy leaving in March, and John and George heading out by mid-April. The problem is obviously this. 
none of the Beatles were in India longer than eight weeks. They arrived by mid-February, and then everyone is gone by March and April. During this very short stay, when they were meditating and attending to activities of the retreat, the Beatles found time to allegedly write over 30 songs. One online site called The Beatles in India stated the Beatles wrote 48 songs while hanging with the Maharishi. This narrative is highly questionable. The White Album has a completely different vibe from any of the Beatle albums that came before it as well as after it. The White Album lacks the tightness and polish of the first seven albums. It has none of the psychedelic feel of Sgt. Pepper or Magical Mystery Tour. It lacks the production value of Abbey Road, and it even has a very different feel than Let It Be. The album always came across to me as an eclectic set of 30 songs with various songwriting styles coming into play. I would often refer to it as the Beatles' first solo album. At the time, I bought into what John Lennon called the Beatles' myth and thought the different styles I was hearing was a reflection of each individual Beatle doing their own thing. In other words, I believed the mainstream narrative. However, with the research, I now see the Beatles through a completely different lens. The reason for the eclectic sound is because in all likelihood, there was a mix of composers and songwriters contributing to the pool of songs. Some of these songwriters on the White Album were the Beatles, and others were not. And the reason for the obvious departure from the earlier albums, even records like Rubber Soul and Revolver, is because the people writing for the White Album were not the same people writing songs during the 1962 through 1966 period. And it appears the Beatles, who were relegated primarily to vocals when recording the early albums through Revolver, started to play on more recordings beginning with Sgt. Pepper and into the White Album, Abbey Road, and Let It Be. I came to this conclusion by noticing distinct differences in playing styles when comparing the 1962 through 1966 period with the playing styles from 1967 on. For example, the precise timekeeping of the drumming from the earlier records disappears once we get to Sgt. Pepper. After Revolver, the drumming is not nearly as tight and precise, which signaled to me that Ringo was now behind the drum kit on most songs on the later albums. Although, it should be pointed out, he did not drum on Back in the USSR, Martha My Dear, Dear Prudence, The Ballad of John and Yoko, and Don't Pass Me By, the latter being his own composition. The drummer on these songs was Billy. The same goes for the guitar work. The guitar playing on the early records was above the play grade of any of the Beatles. Norwegian Wood is a good example of guitar work that John Lennon was not capable of pulling off. Earlier in the presentation, we discussed how George Harrison struggled to nail down a lead guitar part for Sgt. Pepper, which Billy ended up completing. There was an overall musical precision and professionalism from the 1962 through 1966 period that is not found afterwards. This is because the Beatles did not play or played very little on the early records. The early material was recorded by session and studio musicians. The Beatles' job was to sing on the albums, play concerts, and be the veneer for Tavistock's social engineering agenda. If I had to guess, the people writing the music for the White Album were connected into Billy, a.k.a. Paul McCartney, who by this time was calling all the shots pertaining to the Beatles. Who was going to argue with the guy that masterminded Sgt. Pepper? A record which is still considered one of the greatest rock albums of all time. Billy's prominence is probably why George Martin picked up and left during the White Album sessions. There's no sense in having two producers. The official story of how the material for the White Album manifested is fiction. The Beatles did not write over 30 songs during their short stint in India, and they certainly did not record 27 songs in a single day at George Harrison's Escher Bungalow in May of 1968. Both scenarios are not credible. The Beatles had a template, and that template had a team of composers and songwriters writing songs from which George Martin and later Billy would source material from. I believe it's very possible Billy was part of this songwriting team going back to at least 1965 
during the Help and Rub a Soul sessions. I believe the material for the White Album was written or in the process of being written before the Beatles went to India and certainly before May 30th. And the Escher demos were rehearsals recorded over a period of time, versus one unknown day in May of 1968. It is likely a good number of the tracks on the White Album were recorded by session musicians, which would include Billy. However, I do not discount the premise that the individual Beatles, in particular John and George, wrote some of their own material and play on the album, as the stringent protocols that were in place during the 1962 through 1966 period were relaxed a bit once Billy officially took over the band, starting with Sgt. Pepper. The interesting thing is, beginning with the White Album, I believe we actually get to experience more of what the Beatles sounded like as a band, since they are more actively involved in the playing and recording of the album. And the reason I didn't say starting with Sgt. Pepper is because Pepper was tightly controlled by George Martin and Billy. Even the other Beatles stated there was a lot of sitting around during the Pepper sessions. This was because Billy was the driving force behind the album. So this is my take on how things evolved, which might not be perfect, but to me, it's far more plausible than the official narrative given to us as to how the White Album came about. The Beatles did not write over 30 songs in India, and they did not record 27 songs on a single day in May of 1968. Yet somehow, 30 songs emerged, and it's not because they were prolific musical geniuses with supernatural ability. It's because behind the scenes, there was a network of songwriters and composers writing the songs. So as with Rubber Soul, we have stories and details which contain significant gaps and holes, which results in the narrative unraveling once we start to pull the thread on the sweater. The story behind the White Album is very similar to Rubber Soul. Both albums lead with the Beatles having the ability to prolifically write songs within impossible time frames and then turning out albums which are widely considered masterpieces. Don't get me wrong, the music is great, but it just did not happen the way we were told. Now let's wrap up the presentation with my final thoughts. So did the Beatles write all their own music? The answer for me, based on my research, is no, they did not. The Beatles were indeed a construct of Tavistock, who were created to break down the existing cultural and societal framework and foster in a new age of what the controllers consider enlightenment. When John Lennon said the Beatles were craftsmen, and by the time the Beatles arrived in America, they were already old hands, what he was telling us is the Beatles were groomed and brought along from very early on to play the role that they played to alter the course of history. In other words, the Beatles were in the pipeline for a long time, going back to at least the early days of Hamburg, and I would argue even before that, perhaps as far back as their childhood. This does not mean, as teens or young men, that they were overtly aware of the path they were placed on, but that they were people who were steering them in a specific direction, a direction that would ensure they were prepared for the roles they would play on behalf of Tavistock's massive psychological and social engineering initiative called The Beatles. Very little of the mainstream narrative about The Beatles and their story is true. Most of it is fiction. The Cinderella story of four working-class lads who met a small record store owner and then took the world by storm is just that, a story. A story that was marketed and sold to the masses who then openly embraced the narrative and thus the change with very few understanding the ensuing transformation of the collective mindset. It is my conclusion the Beatles wrote none to very little of the music during the 1962 through 1966 period. Those songs were crafted by professional songwriters and composers and then recorded by studio musicians, not the Beatles. George Martin and the leadership involved in the Beatles project were not going to waste time and money, and most importantly, the momentum of a movement called Beatlemania, by dedicating time to try and generate something out of four lads whose resume consisted of playing cover music in bars and clubs and nothing else. The Beatles' non-stop live performances going back to 1961 and 1962 
where they spent two-thirds of those years playing for hours each night was all in preparation to be the face of Tavistock's music once the switch was thrown. As craftsmen, they were very adept at playing back the songs they were taught to play. But their musicianship, although good enough to play live, would not cut it in the studio where perfection was sought by George Martin. And in my opinion, Martin is the most important person in this story, because without him, none of this could have happened. So in the end, the Beatles were a more elaborate version of the Monkees, at least through 1966. And then I believe the dynamic changed once Billy took control of the Beatles. Starting with Sgt. Pepper, John, George, and Ringo are now participating more in the recording of the album, but we still have Billy interceding when he thought John or George's track was not what he was looking for or up to his expectations and standards. I believe their contributions continue with the White Album, but the entire body of work is still being augmented by songwriters and musicians outside the band. We have to remember, everything we know about the Beatles is from what we have been told through books, films, and other media. The same people that gave us the Beatles' psychological operation are the same people who gave us the fictional backdrop and history. But for those with eyes to see and ears to hear, they also left us clues as to the real story behind the Beatles. And with that, I would like to thank everyone who worked with me on this presentation. It was a long and winding road, and I could not have done it without each and every one of you. I hope you enjoyed the presentation, and thank you for watching.
Let me see. 